everybody, and welcome to another Wednesday broadcast of the live stream of the This Week in Science podcast. Do you want to know about science? This is where you should be. Do you want to hear some cool things? This is where you should be. And you should tell your friends about it. So right now, hit those likes, subscribes, notification bells, all of it, and share with your friends so that everybody comes and we can all discuss the science together because I see you all in the chat rooms and uh, we we can integrate your commentary as we converse here on the show. Just want to let you know that this is live streamed. There will be an edited version of the podcast. And so if you want the edited thing, go subscribe to the podcast. But you are here right now for the if, ands, buts, or whatever happens. And um, I've got a wonderful guest tonight, and I hope you are ready for some great science fun. Are we five by five? Yeah. Yes. In the chats, you tell me we are five by five. Boop, boop. Ready to go. So let us begin this show in, I'm going to move my screen around a little bit, in three, two, this is twist. This Week in Science, episode number 965, recorded Wednesday, March 27th, 2024, Science for Our Future Fossils. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we're going to fill your heads with memories, machine learning, and stinky teens. But first, disclaimer, 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 the future. It is a place of dreams and expectations, a realm of imagination that we create through our choices every day. The future, it's a place of probability and possibility, not a promise, nothing certain to gain. If we just wait, it will come, just like This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek Good science, everyone, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We have a great show ahead that I do hope that you fully enjoy. On this week's show, I am joined by paleontologist, futurist, and host of the Future Fossils podcast, Michael Garfield. And if you've been a Twist fan going back a while, you might also recognize Michael's name from one of the past twist science music compilations. So he's also a musician and has been a twist <laughs> contributor for a long time. What was that? 2007? Seven. Yes. Thank you for joining yeah. us tonight. It's a blast. I've been a fan of your show for 19 years. That's the longest. Uh, like I have friends that are younger than my appreciation for you. <laughs> <laughs> and we are finally connecting on this episode. I mean, we've we have connected in real life previously, but um, it's really great to have you on the show to actually talk about some of the things that uh, you're interested, where our interests kind of combine and are you know, collide. And so, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, yeah, how? I mean. <sighs> Way to make me feel old. But anyway, instead, I'm going to take it as the good gracious. We are a resilient show, and we are just continuing to bring you science every single week. And as we jump into the show here, everyone, I want to remind you that subscribing to the Twist podcast is going to get you the podcast edited and wonderful in your ears every single week on whatever platform, if you look for This Week in Science or Twist. We're also on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch, and we live stream weekly, 8 p.m. Pacific time. 
Uh, we've got uh, what is it? Wednesdays. That's right. It's a Wednesday. <sighs> I forget everything. Time. It's relative. Um, all the places look for This Week in Science. We're also on social media, so I do hope that you look for us there. If you have questions, please head over to our website, twist.org. Oh, I have lots of stories about brains and machine learning and stinky te teens. So, uh, Michael, are you ready to go? Always. <laughs> Especially right. now, yes. <laughs> As Especially now, let us begin. Let's start with the formation of memories. And honestly, to you all out there, if this story becomes something that you remember, it's because I broke your brain. Or uh, more scientifically, based on the research that has currently been published in the Open Access Nature uh, Journal, actually just, just today, uh, formation of memory assemblies through the DNA sensing TLR9 pathway. Now that sounds like a bunch of like bloop, 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 bloop. TLR proteins and genes are toll-like receptors and there are a number of them and they are involved in all sorts of processes uh, and they are very important for interacting with the immune system and kind of creating processes that uh, that fix things. And in this particular study, for the first time, researchers actively showed that in the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain, in humans, it's like kind of right between your ears in the brainstem area. Um, in birds, which is what I studied, it's like right on top. They like it up on top. But uh, the hippocampus, we know, is very important for the formation of memories also for navigation and other things. So the hippocampal neurons, we know they respond and they activate certain protein synthesis pathways when things are happening that need to be remembered. But what actually creates the network of neurons that work together to make a memory a memory? The hippocampus is like the, the, the bus stop where a memory, you know, Information comes in, a memory is kind of put together and packaged, and then it goes out to the rest of the brain for the brain, the rest of the brain to store. In this process, though, what these researchers have found is that in an area of the hippocampus called CA1, the neurons that get stimulated during an event actually have double stranded DNA breaks. So their DNA is damaged. And these little tiny pieces of double-stranded DNA like rupture and leave the, the, the nucleus of the cell. And so there's an inflammatory response. And in this inflammatory response, TLR9, toll-like receptor 9, gets, ac uh, gets activated and a bunch of DNA repair processes get started. In this study, they looked at mice. It's not humans, of course. They weren't looking at, at people and you know, chopping up DNA and people brains. But in this study, they were able to determine that when they shut off the toll-like receptor 9 in mouse brains, the mice didn't remember things. And when they upregulated stuff, then it worked a little bit better. So uh, in this situation, what we're looking at is... The immune system, which isn't really historically been considered very much with respect to the brain, and it's getting a lot more attention more recently. Um, but what we're seeing is a, a, a gene and then a protein that also decreases in its abundance as you get older decreases in its abundance, specifically in people who have um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, this gene is specifically involved in the cell population that create a network for a specific event, for a memory. And so this is a piece very early in that process of creating the network of neurons that go on to create 
to like hold a memory, an association within the brain. I know. I love stuff like this. I know it's like very like nitty gritty. There's a little piece of the puzzle, but there's always been this general question of where are memories stored? How do we remember things? Where, how does that even start? And people talk about networks of neurons and this and that, but suddenly we have a piece of the puzzle and it has to do with damage. Something occurs to damage the DNA in neurons because neurons don't copy themselves, right? The neurons are just there, but there's breakage. And because of the breakage, the immune system gets, gets involved. And the immune system then is part of the process of creating a network of neurons that hold a memory. I don't know. What do you think, Michael? Well, I mean, this is, I, I haven't followed up on this particular strand, but I remember about a decade ago, I read a piece on the, uh, what they call the intense world syndrome for autism mm -hmm. spectrum. Uh, they were, there was a, a hypothesis that uh, suggested that there, uh, you know, certain individuals fall on one end of a distribution of sensitivity to what most people would consider normal childhood stimuli. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that those people have, uh, you know, they're, they're like a, there's a kind of a bouquet of symptoms in uh, autism and Asperger's that mm -hmm. they were saying were uh, people's memories were unusually strong because it was like they were being traumatized by normal levels of experience. And that this was, this was related to the differences in the development mm -hmm. of, um, you know, there's like uh, uh, affective em empathy, but then there's also uh, an empathy that's more like based on theory of mind due to personal mm -hmm. relationships. And that it was the, the avoidance of interpersonal contact because of the intensity of relationship that was leading to uh, underdeveloped theory of mind in, in certain people. But it could be, it, you know, if those people were raised in an environment where things could be kind of stimuli, could be down-regulated in their intensity, that they could develop a theory of mind that it wasn't like, uh, uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, part of, anyway, like that, this is just like another, when I'm li listening to this story, it just kind of makes me think about, uh, you know, another thing that, uh, they talk about, you know, the relationship between trauma and memory and mm. in the brain and the relationship between, yeah. uh, you know, trauma and inflammatory response. And yes, stress, and, yeah. the so, biggest stress in the inflammatory response. And yeah. so PTSD and why do certain memories become held so much more strongly in our memory than others? So, yeah, I, yeah, I think you're, I think you're onto something there. And uh, Patrick, in the YouTube chat is saying, so anti-inflammatories are bad for memory. Great. And actually, uh, the authors of this study are concerned about some of the uh, treatments for COVID-19 uh, because the uh, some of these treatments do impact the TLR9 pathway. So um, there are questions as to, you know, uh, I guess the cost benefit to uh, what we use as anti-inflammatories, how we stimulate or downregulate the in, the immune system, um, and TLR nine. These toll-like receptors. There's no, this is number nine, but there's lots of them. So uh, it's not like this is the only one. They're all specifically involved in different functions, um, but it's. Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's a very interesting point as to, you know, how individual immune systems are tuned or attuned to certain stimuli and how they respond and specifically what's going on here. So anyway, Can I ask you a question as far as oh, that is concerned? always <laughs> sure. So um Back when I was still host of Complexity Podcast, I interviewed Peter Sheridan Dodds at the University of Vermont, who does uh, time series analytics, uh, or did anyway, time series analytics on Twitter data, mm. and found that something happened in 2020 where... Uh, something? Yes, yes. The yeah. people were, people, uh, basically, uh, people were core, like the sort of 
formation of linear, like serial episodic memory was disrupted in that year. Mm -hmm. And so people in August were remembering the second wave of COVID as being kind of closer uh, to the first wave of COVID than in March than they were to the George Floyd and Breonna uh, Parker protests in June. And so there was this, you know, there was something like, you know, there was a question about, you know, what uh, maybe remote work had done because, you know, the way that we move through space has a lot to do with the way that we that we uh, form and deposit memory. So mm-hmm. when people are no longer moving and they're stuck in front of a computer all the time, then the, the, the proximity of different experiences in time changes and becomes yep. more a, about, you know, other other ways of traversing a, a network. You yeah. know, uh, it becomes more like kind of poetic or associative. But anyway, it's just funny because I, now, I, you know, the whole time I was thinking, oh, it's just because everybody spends all their time on the computers now that we're not that we're remembering things differently. But it's like, oh, but I also got the jab that year. So who knows? How would you how would you as an in, in, as an experimental design, how would you begin to try and like tease apart those possible uh, like uh, causal factors like how could you even do that? I guess you'd have to do it in mice, and it wouldn't be. It wouldn't well, there's be been a lot of work in mice already because mice spend a lot of their time in a single environment, right? Their lab cage or crate or wherever they are. Um, and there has been a lot of what research into what are called place cells. And so, in the hippocampus, we have these particular cells that are called place cells that recognize or are stimulated. Uh, by particular places or when place changes. So there are, uh, you know, like there are certain cells that the media popped into for pop psychology that are like, oh, face cells. It's the the celebrity cells, you know, where your visual system goes, hey, I know that person. They're Queen Elizabeth or whatever. In the hippocampus, as a navigational uh, organ within our brain, this population of neurons are stimulated by our changes in location and very specific locations. And so there are certain cells that respond to, I'm in my studio, still, 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 you know, and the habituation takes place. And so habituation of neurons is a very big deal because when neurons habituate, they pretty much stop firing. And so you don't have responses in the same way. Um, There has been uh, some literature to the effect that when we change rooms, like go through a doorway or make a particular movement in these place cells, particular ones become active. And it is then like like a new chapter in a book because they mark a time and a place. And there is also, there are timekeeping cells that are based on our circadian rhythm and are specifically like frequency based and they fire very regularly. And so they fire in a particular way that synchronizes then with the place cell. So you have your brain then completely marking a spot. It's like when, uh, you're doing a, uh, an audio recording or a video recording and you want to mark the audio and video at the same time and you tell the person who's on camera to clap or you have the the little click clap board um so our brain does this automatically and we know this because of work that we've done in mice and other uh other animals we expect that people have place cells and it's only going to be through the use of i think um like video games and Um, fMRI, where we can image the brain as people are doing particular behaviors. Um, Maybe some of the more portable brain recording devices will be able to get, it's just the the resolution is not high enough at this point in time. But uh, yeah, that's kind of where we want to be is, you know, starting to look at experiments that can measure the brain's activity when you're in place versus the brain's activity when you're moving versus the brain's activity when you know where you're expected to go versus the brain's activity when you find uh you, when you turn a corner and find a surprise you know you where you are lost 
perhaps. I don't know. I always thought, so uh, burning man person to burning man person, I always <laughs> thought that it would be fun to take an FM fMRI machine out to burning man and uh, measure people before the city was built, while the city was built, and then after the city was being, like when the city was being torn down. And figure out a way to determine uh, how their brain responded to the change in locational cues. Yeah, and also like, Friday night when they tear down all the street signs as a joke. Yeah, exactly. The street signs yeah. come down, the man comes down, there's no, the navigation is then, your, your, your points of reference are completely lost. So anyway, that's kind of, I've had this, I've, I've had this idea for a long time, but getting an fMRI machine out to Burning Man isn't necessarily going to be feasible. So we'll work something out. <laughs> Give it five years. I mean, you wouldn't have thought that, you know, bringing 2000 drones out to Burning Man would have been feasible either, but there you go. There anyway. you go. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Still brainy for the beginning of the show. Uh, this is another big, exciting study out of Dresden University of Technology published in EMBO Journal. And this study used two things that I absolutely love, uh, looking at the brain and organoids. So brain organoids are these mix of cell types that are cultured within the lab to allow the cells to develop in a way that is naturally mimicking development of the human brain. And so uh, there's this question, you know, what is it that allows us to be human? Everybody thinks it's our neocortex, right? We have our ancient brain, our ancestral brain, primitive brain that is emotional, but then all of our logic and the, um, uh, the all of the things that are more reason-based take place in the cortex or the what's called the neocortex and this area of the brain has lots of neurons it lets you be creative it allows us to talk to each other neocortex is very uh it's part of the brain that grows and becomes enfolded and we have all the foldy ridges on in the primate brain whereas mice and bird brains are totally smooth so why is that um and these re researchers uh, used organoids to try and figure out what might be responsible. And in their study, they uh, looked at genetic factors that might be involved in brain expansion and allowing the stem cells or those precursors to the neocortex, the cells that grow into those neurons, to grow more in primates and grow less in mice. And they used a this organoid technology, and in what they developed, they found that there is a particular growth factor called epiregulin. And epiregulin is essential to primate and human neocortical stem cell growth. So again, they looked at the mouse brain, and in their cultures, they were like, if we give them epiregulin, their brain neocortex grows a little bit more. And then they were like, but wait, what about human cells? Oh, look, human cells, if we give them epiregulin, nothing really happens. Oh, let's look at another primate. Let's look at gorillas, of course. And so they looked at gorillas and they determined that when gorillas, which normally have less epiregulin than humans, were given more epiregulin, they had a more growth in their neocortex. So epiregulin, there's kind of like a limit and it seems like humans are at that limit where we don't need anymore, but other primates could potentially have more epiregulin and their neocortex could grow further. So neocortex, very important according to our hypotheses of human creativity, ability to interact, all these things. Um, and this one factor, this growth factor in this particular study uh, suggests that uh, it is a limiting factor to the brain, the neocortex, and those abilities in other primates. 
but not in humans. We've got enough, apparently. Do you have enough? I never feel like I have enough. <laughs> well, like, okay, so this this More. this provokes two questions, right? One, one, at least two. It provokes two in at my least. the brain at with least. that as many folds as I have. One one of which is uh, so, like, if you and, and maybe I'm making a, a kind of foolish assumption here, but like, if you think about uh, you know the like fractal networks and the scaling of fractal networks mm -hmm. and you know like a koala's brain is very smooth a koala's life is very simple if you think about intelligence as you know a response to environmental complexity in at mm -hmm. least in you know the organisms that manage to survive uh, you know uh, by internalizing and being able to model the complexity of their environment so uh you get, you know, the human evolution is full of these interesting feedbacks and kind of chicken egg stories between uh, our intensely social existence and our language and the complexity of our language and our individual intelligence and the complexity of our culture. And so, you know, it's just curious. It's like, okay, so we have more epiregulin than a gorilla, um, yep. the, but the epiregulin came from somewhere. Uh, so what Mice was it? have it. So yeah. it, like, it is something that is a growth factor that is conserved. It is involved in the, the development of certain neurons and certain parts of uh, the neocortex in mammals generally. Um, yeah. So why did it, why did its levels change? What happened? Well, well, more, even more than that, like uh, often these features like, you know, some trade is exapted, like it evolved somewhere else first and then it gets repurposed. And so just idle question would be, where do we actually see epiregulin emerge on the tree of life? And is it being used for this where it first appears yeah. or was it used for something else? And then the next question is kind mm -hmm. of like, well, if we are at our limit, how much does the fact that we've kind of hit the, the, uh, you know, the asymptote of what, epiregulin can do for us, what does that have to do with the uh, kind of uh, pernicious, of, yeah. <laughs> like, like the fact that we outboard so much of our, our individual cognition into, uh, you know, diverse niches within a complex society and out like writing and like, you know, all these other ways that we extend cognition into our environments, you know. But anyway. that's an ability that is allowed because of our sensory system and our neocortex. And yeah, and we'll talk about a body embodiment and how that all works in a little bit. Um, we're going to get back to that topic because this is, I like this topic. Embodiment is very important to me. Uh, but yeah, I think it is, your questions I think are, are right on track because what is the... In, what, are, what are species differences in this particular uh, growth factor, the gene expression, and when and where does it uh, does it exist, and how is it how is it expressed, and why? So, yeah, what are, what are we gonna do with this information? If humans can't use it, are we going to go like um, what is it, the uh, Uplift series, Sun Diver, give it? Give it to the dolphins. Give it, I, I don't. What are we doing? I, and maybe it's Douglas Adams, and you know the mice will rule everything eventually. But yes, well, yeah. George Dvorsky of <laughs> IO9 talks about animal uplift a lot, and yeah, it's like maybe we're at that point where like interspecies internet initiative, you know, interspecies.io. They're trying to do the machine learning to communicate with non-humans. It's like, well, you know, maybe a dolphin, or maybe not a dolphin, but yeah, maybe maybe. Uh, a gorilla or a raven ends up uh, up, reg up regulating this uh, growth factor in order to adapt to a more complex technological environment. We just start seeing it happen. Yeah. Or maybe we I do think, it. Or maybe we do it. Maybe we force it through. I don't know. But humans, we, we change our environment all the time. We like to fix things and, and make lots of changes, which is why researchers want to make beer better. Of course, there's always improvements in uh, beer 
that can be made, I guess. Uh, researchers, again, publishing in Nature Communications Open, Open Access, their study using machine learning, uh, creating a model to that they uh, they have an algorithm that was their best performing algorithm called gradient boosting um, that was able to take the information from 180,000 consumer reviews uh, to be trained and also have 200 over 200 chemical properties quantitative descriptive sensory information um, and outperform some of like the the leading ways of deciding how beer should be made and should taste. Uh, so in this study, they say, ta-da, our study reveals how big data and machine learning uncover complex links between food chemistry, flavor, and consumer perception and lays the foundation to develop novel tailored foods with superior flavor. Is AI going to make beer better? Is this is this is this where we're going now? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I love talking with like the microbiologists who are like, I'm going to work with all of the yeast strains and make new yeast strains and do this. Oh, we'll fix all of the all of the stuff, but perhaps this is now going to be the way that these microbiologists work with artificial intelligence to be able to change aspects of the yeast and the fermentation process and the other ingredients that make it will be a Spotify algorithm for beer. Oh, It'll geez. create a beer playlist tailored to your genome. Oh no. You're gonna you're just gonna end up like again, you're gonna get stuck in a box. You'll never taste anything new. I mean, although I did I don't like beer that has a banana flavor. It's not really my thing, but that's just me. But I wouldn't know that if I hadn't tried it. So oh, all the algorithms. I don't know. We can get to that later. Yeah, it's a serious <laughs> thing. We can get to it later. <laughs> so much putting off until later. Yes, the but the, the big question here, though, is, you know, or the the reality is, this is harnessing machine learning, taking human sensory data and opinion, you know, it's not objective, right? <laughs> it's subjective. And it's putting it together in large databases, along with um, other chemical information that can be cross correlated um, because of the algorithms that they're using. Um, not all other, and also as this showed, they used 10 different algorithms to uh, test, and only one was the best. What this doesn't Which, include is a kind of evolutionary game theoretical component, because like if, if we were to instrumentalize this in some sort of, uh, you know, uh, consumer optimization implementation, uh, people would adapt to it. You know, you'd get you'd get this sort of economic, um, up, up, you know, p people would start, they would become hipsters that are actively <laughs> rejecting the algorithmically designed beer. They would, yeah. they, they would demand human beer, you know, and so you'd get this, you'd get some sort of uh, arms race resulting in an equilibrium where, you know, like there, there's a, uh, an, a sufficiently large population of people that are d deliberately drinking bad beer. It's like know? Portland. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, everything's artisanal here. <laughs> yes, you only come here because you love the artistry. Oh my goodness. Okay, moving forward in this, um, this has nothing to do with machine learning, but uh, you're a parent, yes, Michael? I don't have teenagers yet, so I'm no. I'm lucky that my house still smells well. I don't know. They got diapers. It's 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 only but babies. Better. This is yes. this is this is the story, right? Babies they smell nice, and teenagers they start to smell smelly, and uh, less nice. 
So there's a, there's a point between babyhood, around three years old or so, or so and that early preteen, teenageriness, and there's a change in how the offspring smell. Um, and as a, a parent of a 13-year-old boy child, um, I can attest to the fact that he's wonderful, but boy child, 13, is different. Um, it's, it doesn't smell like the baby anymore. Researchers just published in Communications Chemistry their study looking at body odor samples. They took little pad things and stuck them in the armpits of babies up to three years old and also uh, teenagers up to about 18 years of age, 14 to 18. And then these cotton pads were collected, analyzed with mass spectroscopy, uh, gas chromatography. They identified chemical compounds. And then they also had the peoples sniffing the odors and assessing what was happening. Um, <laughs> and this is my favorite part of this particular study is that not, we know body odors change. Uh, number one, you are not responsible for your body odor. The microbes on your body are responsible for your body odor. So this is indicative of the fact that the ex exterior microbiome of a human being is changing during development as a result of certain factors that affect from the interior to the exterior. It might just be that, you know, teenagers uh, don't, shower as much. I don't, I don't know. Um, but I love this where they, they determined that the little, the babies had certain things in common, certain chemicals in common, but there were, uh, certain compounds that were specifically found in post -puber pubertal children, post puberty, uh, squalene specifically is one of the chemicals that uh, has been characterized in this particular study. And um, adults telling <laughs> telling the researchers what, what they, they thought they smelled, um, they refer to uh, teenagers as uh, musty, musky, cheesy, goat-like. <laughs> in odor. <laughs> Whereas babies are sweet like candy. <laughs> I mean, this is this is to the, you know, the kind of the trope in ecology that a lot of populations are age partitioned. You know, that there's, I don't know if that's actually what's going on here, but, you know, you could argue that there's resource competition and that, you know, there's this whole thing about, mm -hmm. you know, the adults Ooh, I love that. Their teenagers yes. out of the house, you know, and, and so maybe, I mean, but it's that question, you're like teenagers smell good to each other, of course, right? Like they're, or they don't they're notice at that it. point it's where they're starting time. to form yeah. their own kin group, you know, like, I mean, uh, you know, out, out of kin group affiliations, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, well, you want your baby to smell good because that baby needs you. But by the time they're a teenager, it's like, well, you know, go pay for your own lunch. And I think that is one of the very interesting uh, items that the researchers are thinking about is, you know, what does this change in odor have to do with kind of that external manipulation of parents and caregivers? And so it's it's possible that they're, they want to do work further to understand the impact <laughs> of these odors the goat-like odors. <laughs> I mean, the thing parents. that concerns me about studies like this, they're talking about it in the chat here. The thing that concerns me is like, you know, this question of why. If, mm -hmm. if Justin were here, he would be like, why did they do this study? We know teens smell. Uh, and the answer is probably, right, that they, I mean, it even says so in the in the Phys Org report, you know, mm -hmm. that they're, uh, we might be able to, it might prove fruitful for makers of odor control products. So of course this is like, you know, right. paid for by the deodorant industry. But then you get right. into these questions with with artificial fragrances, which is like uh, like with artificial hormones. It's like, well, this is, this is disrupting an important channel of communication 
it, that we're taking that, you know, like this is, this is doing something, you know, like Chesterton's fence, you know, maybe you shouldn't mm -hmm. get rid of the fence until you know why it's there. You know, maybe we should exactly. have yes. the teenagers around. Maybe there's, maybe we're supposed to kick them out of the house. That's the whole thing. Individuation and that separation from the parents, that is something that takes place during those teen years. And it is, you know, not necessarily just behavioral. It could also be metabolic and physiological as well. Yes. Oh, the smells we smell, the things. It could be a Dr. Seuss book. Um, two more studies for the first part of the show to go. Um, researchers have been looking at the ability of tardigrades to survive uh, harsh stresses, uh, environmental stresses like outer space um, and just very drying out, you know, during drought periods. Tardigrades have genes that allow their bodies to survive all sorts of things. And previously, researchers have shown that they have uh, these these proteins that can create kind of like a hydrogel or they, they create like a matrix within the tardigrades that changes the tardigrade metabolism um, and allows them to go into the, what's called their ton state or like a biostasis. And they, that is a place they can stay almost indefinitely until the conditions allow them to be revived. These researchers who uh, <laughs> just published in a, a, the journal Protein Science from the University of Wyoming, they took um, human embryonic kidney cells and they put this tardigrade protein into the human kidney cells uh, and were able to show that these human kidney cells, um, the protein, so when they were, the human cells were exposed to the stresses, the tardigrade protein created the matrix in the hydrogel. They created the fibers inside of the cell. Um, and it also slowed metabolism within the cell. And then those human cells, it, it could be reversed. And the cells could be revived. So... I'm obviously thinking like, oh my gosh, this is like cryostasis. Like this is, this is our, you know, century, you know, century ships and uh, other, other things. We're going to use tardigrade science uh, to, <laughs> to genetically modify ourselves so that our bodies can go into a biostasis and then be restored at the end of this, this point in time. Right now, of course, this is in, in vitro, what is it? In the vitro. Anyway, it's in the cells in a dish. It's not in vivo in living organisms. But the cells that have the proteins, they go into biostasis. They're resistant to stress, and the cells can uh, return to normal metabolism afterwards. So anyway, tardigrades solving humans' space cryostasis problems, maybe. <laughs> Are you familiar with the science fiction of of Peter Watts? He was uh, one of these these great guys, you know, trained as a biologist and then went on to write some of the most like insane yeah. yeah. sci-fi. And he starts his book Blind Sight with exactly this kind of passage. He says, you know, uh, you wake. He's talking about you know somebody who's been on a long space mission. You wake in an agony of resurrection, gasping after a record shattering mm -hmm. bout of sleep apnea spanning 140 days. You can feel your blood syrupy with dobutamine and Luke, uh, excuse me, luencephalin forcing its way through arteries shrivel, shriveled by months on standby. Yeah, he's like, he's right there with you. Like, let's yeah. let's realize this. So in this case, it's a, a, a compound that's called C-A-H-S-D. And that is uh, these tardigrades intrinsic, intrinsically disordered proteins. So C-A-H-S proteins. They can form these hydrogels. Um, but yeah, this is the D form specifically from the tardigrade seems to be similar to the, the compound that Watts was describing in that science fiction intro. Yeah, you, pro you probably wouldn't feel great to revive after something like this. 
No, I mean, that's why, you know, he loves this like, horror. It's horror. It's a horror story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So CAHS is cytoplasmic abundant heat soluble proteins. So they're heat soluble, able to survive desiccation uh, and can also precondition cells to survive drying. And in this particular state, water loss would be very important. So I would imagine that Ooh, I don't think people would enjoy it very much, but I don't know. Maybe there's this is first not century ships and going to space, but maybe preservation of organs so that we can deal with some of the issues of organ transplantation. Maybe there's a way that we can allow organs to survive longer before they're able, they're able to get to people who need them. Um, maybe this is uh, there are a lot of potential aspects for understanding what exactly this is going to lead to. But I don't know. I love tardigrades. They are they survive all sorts of stuff. We're puny humans. We're also not half a millimeter long, so they can get away with all kinds of stuff that we can't just because of the size. You know, there's that, that great quote about, you know, if you throw a rat down the well, it bounces. If you throw a human, he breaks. And if you throw a horse, it splashes. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, we, we were we were kind of already there, but yeah. Auditory visuals. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So I had I said two more stories, but that was it for my stories for the start of the show. Uh, unless you want to keep going on our tardigrade human future. All right, everyone. This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to get into uh, a deep dive in just a moment here. But I do want to remind all of you that if you're enjoying the show, please share the show with people you think might like it. Share it with a friend today. The link's right there. Send it out. Copy, paste, send. It's easy. Also, subscribe if you haven't. Click the notifications and the, uh, the little bell buttons. Make sure you're subscribed. Um, and if you're already there, the other place you can go is twist.org. Click on the Patreon link to support us through our Patreon. $10 per month and more will get you uh, thanked at the end of the show by name. I read a long list of names. It's a really, it's a thing. I get to name you after the show. It's great. Also, we have merchandise in our Zazzle store and a portion of those receipts of those purchases do go to support the show and keeping everything going, you know, the back end of the websites and all the things. If you love twists, help us out. Let's keep going. Thank you for your support. Really cannot do this without you. Okay. We're going to come back right now for more this week in science. And I do want to reintroduce our guest tonight. For this episode, Michael Garfield is a paleontologist, futurist, host of the Future Fossils podcast, a writer, a musician, visual artist, public speaker, and oh my goodness, so much more. His mind is a whirlwind of chaotic connections envisioning the future from the knowledge of today. And as his about page states, following will lead to a kaleidoscopic avalanche of explorations into human technology co-evolution, the pre and post history of creativity and communication and other soulful and submersive, subversive, I like subversive, submersive, submersive, blah, 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 sub, subversive futurism. <sighs> Michael, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. I, I, you know, this was one of the first podcasts I ever listened to back when I was, drawing frogs for four hours a day in the herpetology wing of the university of kansas natural history museum the best job i ever had sounds like... frogs and listening to you oh sounds like a great combination <laughs> i mean i love frogs blair loves frogs as well so that would be wonderful but you've moved on from drawing frogs and you're not only a podcast host and as the uh intro here that I've just made states like you, you are very multi-talented and into all sorts of things. But um, what I've seen from you and your posts on social media and your, the podcasts that you've hosted is that you are really constantly on the edge, the bleeding edge of philosophical exploration. Um, 
I think that would be really challenging for a lot of people psychologically. And I just would love to know what drew you to this intersection of humanity, technology, and the future. Well, I mean, the uh, profusion of hyphens in that description, I think it ought to be just like a flag basically stating that I'm kind of a textbook schizotypal weirdo, high noise brain, you know, you said it yourself, you know, chaotic brain, David Krakauer, the president of the Santa Fe Institute, uh, when I still worked there called me high temperature in the sense of like simulated annealing, you know, I love um, so there's, there's a phase. high temperature. <laughs> yeah. I think that like, you know, that like I, I've been thinking a lot about this cause I'm, I'm very fascinated about the anthropology of science, you know, like what kinds of people get into, uh, a given discipline, uh, and there's always a split. I mean, this isn't just true of science. This is true of really any kind of human pursuit. And uh, the precise balance probably varies. Like if you're an accountant, you probably are more likely to have, uh, you know, more conservative neurophysiology. But uh, in, you know, in the sciences, uh, there are people that are uh, drawn to parsimonious explanatory heuristics like these are the people that want the equation on a t-shirt and then there are people that are drawn to yeah consilience they want the the conspiracy theory wall with all of the connections between everything and i think that you know generally speaking every human society is a is some kind of distribution uh of these two different neurotypes and that they uh that depending on the Num like the the stability of the environment, like the the environmentally regular features, uh, the the pace at which the environment changes, that uh, you either end up with more of one or the other, and so you always have like a res a reservoir of variation in the population, so that when things are crazy like they are now historically, uh, things swing somewhat back in the direction of generalists and you you see a movement in the sciences uh from uh you know like the most of the last 350 years was uh you know more about uh, predictive kind of thinking and 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 now you know we've we've moved out of like a Newtonian regime and into a regime where so a lot more science is being done and more all the time in uh, simulations and in evolutionary models. And, you know, so these are like, we've, we've gotten to a point where a huge area of science is about systems that are, are uh, complex and, and adaptive and their behaviors are emergent and they can't be, you know, they can't be predicted from, uh, you know, a, 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 a linear dynamical model. And I think that, so, you know, this is, this is kind of, this is the kind of science that attracts me. Uh, this is the kind of topic that I find fascinating. And this is why I think, yeah, I mean, it is uh, like we were talking about earlier about like stress in the brain and learning. You know, I am a lifelong learner. I think lifelong learning is favored by uh, the conditions of our, our rapidly changing world in a way that it might not have been 300 years ago. And, you know, maybe 300 years ago, I would have ended up in a mental asylum. And, and now I'm a podcaster. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that I don't think that's true. But yeah, I think I mean, our uh, anyway, length of life, evolution, all that stuff is a completely different conversation as to how our brains and everything are set up to develop. But, um, you know, anyone who was not ready to be a lifelong learner evolutionarily was set up to die from not learning from their mistakes. So and not able if they're not able to learn from your environment and ask more questions and adapt to new situations. Uh, that's not survive. You're not, you're not on a survival trajectory there. So anyway, podcaster versus, um, uh, dead fossil, um, or insane, insane asylum. <laughs> it's not podcasting that keeps you pushing the envelope, uh, and asking new questions. I mean, I see you bringing all these things up. Um, but like you bring up modeling 
And as somebody who comes from the sciences and experimental sciences at, at that, uh, I see there being a balance where intrinsically there needs to be modeling, but experimentalism is always going to give us the evidence that can support the theory. You know, the theory, the simulations in a computer are, you know, the computer is never going to be the earth. We're never going to be, you know, Douglas Adams, you know, the, the answer is 42. The planet was a computer that was simulating a planet. And it's, we don't have that capability at this point in time. And do you think the modeling is enough and just having the ideas to push forward and keep pushing the questions is what keeps you going? Uh, I mean, in my case, I, you know, I basically what happened was I went to school for evolutionary biology as a means of getting into vertebrate paleontology and doing paleontological field work. And, you know, that is a very- Brushing off fossils. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's a very grounded, like literally grounded, earthy, not cheesy, musty, <laughs> but you know, yeah. it's it, you 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 you're yeah. kind of a goat, you know. Um, that is, you know, that's a very tactile and uh, tangible science, or at least it was. Interestingly, paleontology is one of these domains that's actually gone more and more into you know uh, biophysical simulations and you know computer modeling in terms of. You know, understanding the physiology and you know, e ecology of extinct organisms. But at any rate, um, that's just what's hot right now, right? Let's the beer AI. Um, but I think that what happened to me was that I read a series of papers in my final year of undergraduate study that got me thinking about much deeper questions, uh, in particular papers about the evolution of syntactic language and about uh, the uh, you know, evolutionarily sustainable or stable strategies rather. So like, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the SSAs, way that, man. yeah, that lying <laughs> persists in a population yeah. because, you know, there's a threshold below which the frequency of lying doesn't overwhelm the, you know, the, uh, it doesn't create so much noise that the the signal flips and people, you know, like people, the recipients start interpreting it differently. So like I started thinking about, uh, I started seeing these, you know, I, what I came later to understand were uh, papers about error thresholds and uh, criticality and phase transitions. And I was like, my God, mm. this is not something that I can study by digging up bones. And I started asking my graduate uh, like the, the, the people that would have been my graduate advisors had I gone on at that time, uh, how I can start asking these big questions about the evolution of intelligence and its relationship to the evolution of language. And they strongly discouraged me from going into grad school, making it like out of the closet with this stuff. This was 2005. They were saying, don't do this. Uh, because your graduate advisor is going to want you to bite off a very small, manageable question. And right. this kind of, you know, highly consilient, synthetic kind of thing is the thing that then more so than now, but it's still, uh, I think, still on average the case that uh, this is the kind of thing that's reserved for people that are later in their careers. Yes, and bigger questions. Exactly. You can you can do the bigger studies after you're emeritus, but when you're right. a graduate student, just do the nitty gritty. Answer the little right. questions, get your dissertation done, move on to a postdoc, learn how it all works, and just make it happen. Right. And so I was your, so yeah. Do what your PI says. Yeah, and that that <laughs> broke my heart. Actually, is what happened. It broke oh. my heart so profoundly I'm so, I'm so that sad. I left academia after 22 years of having no other plan for myself than right. to become a paleontology professor. And oh. I, I ended up just sort of roving around. There's, I mean, there's, there are, uh, you know, the, the Ronin, right? Like there, there are, <laughs> it's interesting, you know, like the, oh, as, now, as now you're world, going into, the... <laughs> well, you know, like there, there's more room in, in uh, the intellectual 
world now for this kind of thing, you know, for unaffiliated uh, independent scholars uh, or, you know, for people that exist kind of in between academia and private research or, you know, like the, the, the ecosystem has become more diverse. And I think in part because like we were talking about, about brain complexity a little earlier, um, you know, the whole system is more complex than it was 20 years ago. And so mm -hmm. more uh, diversity, more niches, you know, more opportunities have opened up. And, but at the time I just ended up uh, basically living this question, which is now what do I do? Who am I? What am, what am I if not a dinosaur scientist? And, oh my gosh, uh, you're, you're like and telling then, me about my life right now. Right, you're in a very similar <laughs> position. Right? Who am this, I? Yeah. This, yeah. So living the question, I what I'm, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the uh, technologist and author Kevin Kelly, and he he has a book about trends in, yeah, in technology called The Inevitable. And one of those one of the twelve trends that he discusses in that book, I've had him on Future Fossils three times, and we talk about this, is that, you know, he says that in an age of cheap compute and uh, uh, easily accessible search, that answers are cheap. You know, that, that we have this extraordinary yeah. trove of network knowledge now. The hard part is learning to navigate that overwhelming surfeit of information. And so what has actually, what, is, what has turned out is that as information, it, Herbert Simon actually talked about this in the 1970s. He said, what does information consume? It, it consumes attention. And so when we have a lot of information, we have a poverty of attention. And that proved to be incredibly prophetic. And so what we have now is a situation where answers are cheap and questions are valuable. And so like, this is why this is why I am the way I am. And I think the why probably the way you are is something to do with this. It's like both of us are, and I, I imagine a lot of people listening recognize that, uh, and I actually, I have a pinned post on my Twitter account, depending on when you listen to this, about this exact thing. It's like, if you want to read a book, a book will give you an extraordinarily uh, distilled answer. Most books are at uh, a phase in the life cycle of knowledge production, where an enormous amount of work has gone into uh, bringing something to a general audience and making something ready for book publishing, you know, um, for market dynamics, and it's it's shaped in a particular way that makes the the knowledge as accessible as possible. So it's kind of like pre-digestion, you know, and then uh, you know if you think yeah. about like knowledge production as a as a social metabolism of information management that the podcast exists at a kind of on the the opposite pole of this process it's uh it's bringing listeners into the the moment that ideas are formed the moment that hypotheses yeah. are proposed you know in conversation uh we have this much larger surface area of you know, recombinant, noisy possibility and exploration. And so I, it's, I don't think it's a surprise that you and I find ourselves living the question and find and, and discovering that in living the question, we uh, were drawn to conversation as a professional pursuit. Yeah, I, I find this. Yeah, I, I, I'm. I hate the word resonating, but I am I'm I'm I am. I'm, 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 I'm resonating with what you're saying right now um but a few things that you that you brought up just in the last couple of minutes um a study two weeks ago out of uh nature human behavior researchers uh actually calling information overload uh, a danger to humanity the same way that air pollution and uh other uh water pollution and other pollutions uh, in our environment are. And there was a study just this uh, this week that I didn't bring up uh, related to uh, our our society's divergence to its two poles. And it's not just the political aspect of where we've ended up because of um, how we've been pushed certain ways and manipulated certain ways. It's also the fact that in our human psyche, we want to find information that agrees with what we already believe and that is what is already our identity and so when people provide that that becomes a point of divergence and so here we have 
you know, social media, podcasting, videos, all the things. Um, people now with this overload of information can choose their own adventure, yet the adventure they're choosing is the adventure that they already want to be in. So Yeah. Actually, it's funny because I, I, I just recently saved this because I thought it was so beautiful. I saved a screenshot of Pearl Rose. Who, I don't know Pearl Rose from anyone, but this this my friend shared this tweet. She said, what we really need now are content destroyers. Oh, <laughs> like this, yes. And so, you know, you think about, you think about, uh, cogn you know, uh, this sort yes. of uh, cognition <laughs> aspect. And there are all of these trade-offs in, uh, in, you know, neurophysiology about how much information, the, you know, the brain is actually a letting into con conscious awareness. Right. And We're only question, supposed to have certain, um, certain, uh, certain number of neurons, certain amount of stimulus per stimuli per moment. Uh, we can only have 150 people that we know, but we know so many more. Um, you know, there's all this stuff about what we can handle psychologically, yet we are beyond that. I don't want, yeah, I don't want to be a disruptor like Silicon Valley. Like everybody wants to be a disruptor. I'm going to disrupt it. This, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you disrupt an ecosystem and everything freaking dies. Okay. Stop it. But I like, right. I want to be like a, a fungus. I want to be a content fungus. And my mycelium is going to go through and digest stuff and make it better for things to grow. <laughs> That's exactly it. Actually, I mean, this you, what you're touching on now is pr probably the principal exploration or inquiry for Future Fossils podcast because it's where like all of my curiosity has has uh, pooled is into this question of you know what does it mean to live through an event like this, you know, a crisis of information scaling, the closest analogy that anyone I know can come up with is the printing press, although that was a that was an event that had at the, you know, a, 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 a slower and kind of more geographically limited radio. thing. Radio, yeah, but, I mean, the phone, the telephone, where suddenly right, but radio could... was radio was was uh, regulated a whole lot more effectively than the, telephone. the printing like press was. Used... Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm just bringing things up right now because right, like, right, I right, feel right. like, the, you know, television, the radio, yes, regulated. But people used to have like party lines where, you know, the, the telephones were all connected and it was like a chat room and people could pick up the phone. Everybody could talk together from their different houses about what they... You what they were watching on TV or listening to on the radio. Like, <laughs> yeah, that, that particular example is really good because we, you know, we, it didn't take long for people to figure out that that's not a sustainable model for communication, that that's entirely too noisy. And it, it reminds me of the story that uh, science fiction author, Annalie Newitz, who, you know, also has written a number of really excellent I love Annalie. nonfiction books. I love Annalie her. talks about this uh, on Doug Rushkoff's team human podcast brings up the early days of cafe culture in yeah. Europe and how people had to learn how to have conversations with one another while in the room with other people that were having conversations with one another that it was it was unmanageable by people that were that were uh, upon whom cafe culture had been thrust by history and we're in a kind of a similar thing now Although I think kind of like the upper regulant mm. thing, it's like we may, you know, we have definitely reached our limit as organisms. And now the question is, how do we Adapt. redesign the built environment or do we have to make intentional modifications to the human organism? And I think, you know, like I'm, I'm fairly conservative as far as my transhumanism is concerned, you know, like I, I don't like tampering with things I don't understand. You know, I was actually, uh, you know, Ian Malcolm of Jurassic Park uh, was ostensibly a researcher at the Santa Fe Institute. And I spent five years there and I work, I wear all black, you know, and I grew up loving that book. Uh, and I, I very much feel like I started out wanting to be Alan Grant and ended up Ian Malcolm. And, mm -hmm. and now I'm sitting here writing another book now on, uh, you know, how do we how do we adapt to a situation where uh, 
you know, the, people love to say the genie is out of the bottle, but I think the Raptors are out of the park, you know? And, and so now the question that we have with these, yeah. these concerns about human technology coevolution are akin to the question that was processed for us in a pop cultural frame when, you know, the, the, over the six Jurassic world movies, you see Raptors go from a monster to a kind of an, uh, an ally or comrade or collaborator, you know? So what does it mean? I mean they're birds. To to a, Come on. Right. Right. They're, they're very smart. Like, you know, blue the velociraptor in, in a relationship of respect and coordination with Owen Grady, the trainer. I don't really care for those most recent movies, but I do like the way that they trace a, uh, a kind of a dialectical arc that is useful for us as a, as a, as a, an analogy for how the way that it might benefit us to start thinking about technology as, as a, as a horse and rider or hawk and trainer rather than, yeah. you know, human versus T-Rex rampaging through San Diego. Yeah. So side note, uh, other study that came out this week, super cool Japanese tits, um, they flutter their wings um, and kind of it's like a behavioral uh, body language communication. So speaking of like your interest in communication and other anim animals, animals and how that ad has adapted. Flutter, say, hey, babe, you go first. That's OK. I make way for you. So these Japanese little birds, uh, they communicate using body language by fluttering their wings and talk to each other without using their voices. So body language has been important and is important ongoing. So I think this, uh, going back to the raptors and the, uh, of the, the pre pre bird, right. Pre avian <laughs> ancestry, um, also gets into this, this question of where are we on the scale of our future and our interaction with where our future is going to go. Obviously we're a part of our environment and creating it, co-creating it. A lot of organisms aren't necessarily that we know of aware of their part in creating the environment that they live in. We are at a point where we're looking around going, dude, this is messed up. Um, and we can also look at a lot of uh, the technology that we're taking part in, social media, a whole bunch of things, and going, oh, that's not, it's not working right. It, it was kind of going, but now is ah, why isn't the internet doing what we wanted it to do? And every, I feel like we're getting tech companied and marketed down into funnels to act certain ways and do certain things and people's agency is being taken away from them. So where, like, how, mm. I don't know. I don't know what my question is here. I, other than <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel about this co-creation of the technology that is going to impact our lives and our future generations? Well, I mean, first of all, let me just say that if this is a question that, interests people please do go into the back catalog of future fossils because i've spent the last eight years prosecuting this particular thing <laughs> um and i and again like a, you know like i write about it on substack and i've written an, an enormous amount about this i on, love it i love medium. I, I saw your stuff your substack it's so great it's like interactive oh, and got all sorts of I, I was i was like wow that's not a normal substack i was very excited oh, and by your also, substack <gasps> and oh my god the person who did your ask a few future fossils thing right. i have been i asked i want to do this for twists i have so Van over Bettauer, 20 uh, uh, years of whatever this is after show but absolutely anyway, do this tangent. well i mean okay. this is this is this is actually a, a a a perfect example of what i'm talking about here uh which is that uh uh a wonderful listener of Future Fossils, Van Bethauer, wrote uh, a conversational interface for the corpus, the training. He trained a machine learning uh, model on over 200 episodes of my show. And then you can ask it a question. And, uh, you know, people are concerned about the quality of the information that they get if you, for instance, 
ask chat gpt a science question right like you and you should be concerned because what a, a lot of these generative uh, ai systems are doing is is creating something whole cloth based on probabilistic associations and the training data and giving you something that's that's made from noise and it's it is carrying uh, biases through and you have no way of auditing the the model to understand how it's forming these statistical correlations and right you know, and so i think it, like, that's a huge point to to make is they're not generative they're probabilistic right that is so, that's the yes. distinction but anyway so it's funny cuz i think you know in a way it's a good thing uh that society right now is is having a real like uh, rubber hits the road encounter with statistics at scale right now that like people are realizing that uh you know what it means that correlation does not necessarily equal causation uh, but there is a whole class of language models uh retrieval augmented generative work models actually will still link to the primary sources that they were trained from and so you can get answers when you go to askfuturefossils.com you can get an answer that speaks the way that i speak Which by the way that you speak right it was like we you know we've been trained through years of science communication to link our sources and so you know you may think that the the source material is biased i mean i certainly am biased like everyone um but by interest by like all of where you came from all sorts of things right but yes. what, the, what the model is doing is is giving you uh a, a reasonable approximation not only of what the the eight years of this show can tell you about a particular topic but it's also pointing you back to the specific 25 second timestamp that he broke he did a you know he's like this is all like modeled in in chunks and so you can, you know, he, he when you ask it a question, it will give you the, the code. And, I, I and this is such this. a big deal. Like, I just got an email today so that was cool. advertising, uh, you know, build a full stack web application that uses retrieval augmented generation to chat with your data. And this is, you know, this is to your question that you asked uh, a, a few minutes ago. Like, this mm -hmm. is, I think, um, this is an important way that human beings are going to be able to adapt to the profusion of, of new information is because obviously like when I'm talking to somebody on social media and they answer one of my questions by linking to a four hour podcast, I'm kind of like, well, thanks buddy. Like, tell me, tell me which 30 seconds I need to listen to. Cause we're all impoverished for time and <laughs> attention. It's not fair. I Don't want, do that to me. Come on. I, I want everybody to be here for the whole hour and a half, two hours, three hours, however long it takes. Come on. No. Right. I mean, when I found out that people were listening <laughs> to, uh, uh, my podcast for SFI on 2X, I was like, but actually most of them were telling me that they couldn't because we talked too fast and we, we linked to too many interesting sources. Anyway, like the, the, the thing, the thing is that, um, uh, you know, I think my mind works in, in the way that, uh, late, uh, former MIT historian, William Irwin Thompson, who's one of my great inspirations, as a thinker and as a knowledge artist, he he called you know he he talked about his rhetorical technique. He called it Wissenkunst, uh, Wissenskunst, which is you know German for knowledge art, as opposed to Wissenschaft, which is uh, you know their word for science, not you know knowledge knowledge craft and knowledge art. He said was uh, was his replacement for the linear. Uh, path traversed through information that is characteristic of a traditional university lecture. He mm. said, we live in a networked age. We live in an age mm. defined by chaotic and complexity dynamics. And therefore, the way that we encode salient features of this age is by speaking in a way that performs the complexity and the network's nature of our knowledge. And so this is what the this is what the the future fossils uh, AI is is doing, and is what I've made a point of doing in the show that since we started. And I think it's why the the AI does such a good job of of um, answering questions in a way that I can approve of. 
You know, mm. and I think, I think you have to approve of it before you right. let it out in the wild, right? I mean, we haven't really stress <laughs> tested it. I haven't, I haven't asked it if my grandma, if it can tell my grandma how to make a bomb. But like, you know, this, I mean, that's what, you know, people are. Now somebody will, like, we'll, we'll put a link well, to it. We'll, we'll but I don't have that information in the show. <laughs> yeah. You know, I didn't scrape the entire internet for this. And I think that that's a huge piece of this. It's like, you know. Um, this is its own database. It is its right. own little, its world that is right. the conversations with specific individuals and the resources and uh, the references that it goes back to. The things that you've written as well. So it's all content you've created um i mean this is we can create this is a content world. destroyer yes this, this 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 trims it's it's a it's an elegant ui that prunes information back down to the human scale allows right. you to have a conversation so, with something rather than sit there five years listening to everything right you can follow a particular thread if you're interested, uh, say, for This Week in Science, if we were to create this kind of thing, you could follow all of the synthetic biology stories that we've covered for the last 20 more plus years. You know, all of the, you know, or whatever. What does Justin think about this kind of thing? What does Blair <laughs> think about pandas? You know, like we could answer these. <laughs> the AI could very specifically lead to answers and then references within our content blocks that could answer these questions for people. Um, but I like this as the co-creation and this, the you know, like the content destruction um, or the ability. We're creating the content, which might be long, in terms of a podcast and some people take the time because of their commute or their work habits or whatever it is to sit and watch and listen and take advantage of that time. Other people listen to it at 1.5, two times so they can get through it faster, but they want the whole thing. Other people want the small answers. They want the clips. And so being able to use AI to be able to represent ourselves in an in a in an accurate way, authentic way, I think is going to be very important. Um, I do worry though about the ethics of uh, AI moving forward generally, and just how we talk about it. Like uh, the majority of people have taken on the idea of just AI, and we've said it: AI, 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 AI. What the uh, artificial intelligence? AI that means nothing. Like, honestly, it has become a meaningless term. And what is your feeling about how uh, and whether as science communicators, we need to be more specific when we talk about things as um, not artificial intelligence, like, oh, Elon Musk says, because he's pushing Grok and blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> by the end of this year, we're going to have a, a human level intelligent AI. Well, Machine learning, large language model, um, you know, whatever, like, do you think we should be using more specific terminology for these specific uses? I mean, I, I am a lifelong proponent of using the most specific language one possibly can and within the constraints of the conversation that you have to have, right? Like I had a right. University of Utah philosophy professor T. Nguyen on Future Fossils for episode 175. And one of the things that he and I talk about is how, uh, actually, you know, it's it's funny, um, Doug Engelbart in one of his, uh, the founding papers on on modern communication, uh, actually, no, sorry, it was, it was uh, J.C.R. Licklider and Bob Taylor, talk about look at you remembering names and referencing things jcr and licklider and 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 bob taylor uh who helped found personal computing and and the internet Uh, if you go back and read mitch waldrop's history the dream machine really interesting story about the world we're living in. mitch is great Um, i love mitch i know him he's fantastic so he (laughs) <laughs> he's, you know, he's a fabulous science historian. Anyway, yes, the, the uh, Licklider and Taylor talk about how scaling destroys communication. And when I had T. Nguyen on the show, you know, we talked about how this creates a problem in science communication, a very fundamental problem in science communication, because experts uh, 
and non-experts. Basically, it's the expert identification problem. You don't know yep. how to identify an expert. There uh, it and, is. Mm -hmm. And if you're not yourself an expert. Yep. And so this is not just about climate science. This is not just about ep epidemiology. This is about, you know, uh, Bob, you know, Joe Bob down the street and his cow, and you're not an expert in his cow. There's like, this is an n-dimensional problem. It has to do with local information sampling and, and local bias and, and the fact that everyone's forming unique models based on their, you know, their experience. And so uh, when it comes to communication, uh, I, I think that what happens is when you, again, this is to the point of like why it's useful to have uh, language models that are, or any, you know, AI models generally, uh, they don't have to be based on text, uh, are, it's important to have access to systems that can that allow you to train models on limited data sets. Because what you have with ChatGPT is uh, something that's spitting out statistical averages in the same way that when you listen to pop radio, like top 40 pop music is just the lowest common denominator of what everybody likes. And, and again, oh my gosh. Like, the, the late eighties, so, like Casey Kasem's top 40. Right. Oh my right. gosh. And then, you know, I mean, say solid gold. Will, oh my gosh. Right. right. I mean, there it's are problems about Spotify just giving you what you want to hear. Uh, but it's a different, it's a, it's a different order of problem than being forced to listen to the same five songs as everyone else all day, every day. And, and so when it comes to, when it comes to communication, we, we, your question about how, like, uh, how, how uh, granular should we be in the language depends a lot on uh, yeah. the scale at which we're attempting to communicate. Uh, you know, so it's like, if I'm, if I'm talking to you, right, like right now, I'm painfully aware that I'm, I'm talking to a lot of people I don't know, and right. I'm probably saying you're talking things to me, I'm going to have to go back and explain to a lot of later. Yeah. Right. And this is a huge issue with, with, this was the issue that Lickletter and Taylor were pointing to in communication in their, you know, in, in their, their work on, on, uh, computer assisted communication. Cause what they were saying was the, uh, they weren't using the term AI at the time, but their vision for the future of computing was that uh, computing computers will one day help us translate our mental models in ways that are uh, that are instantly legible to people with very different sets of life experience. So, like oh, Google yeah, Translate yeah. is just the yeah. very beginning of what we're going to see. We don't have this right <sighs> now. We're okay, right on so, the cusp okay. of being able to have this where, okay. you know, as uh, where we will be able to uh, use metaphors that go through some kind of conversion pipeline. So like if, like you were saying a moment ago, like if somebody wants this podcast to be a book, it'll be a book because that's the way that they absorb information best. You know, if I use an analogy that doesn't make sense to somebody, my personal AI diamond will adjust that in converse in a handshake you know an encrypted handshake with that person's ai diamond you are like the the bird fluttering its feathers to say no you go first you'll understand right. that because the algorithm will understand the feather fluttering <laughs> and exactly you, and, and that no, person you might be first. a dolphin it's communicating with ultimate babble and, fish yeah <laughs> exactly and actually it's funny because you know bringing up peter watts Watts makes uh, a very similar case in his follow-up to Blindsight, the book called Echopraxia, where he, he, you know, he's got a spaceship full of scientists, and he says every one of them speaks a language with a speaking population of one. Yes. And in a weird, you know, oh it's like a gosh. kind of a scary future, but it no, is the it future. it is the reality right it now. It is the logical conclusion of this of this process because evolution is, uh, you know, is a a, a process whereby through the the exploitation of every available niche and the, the recombinant production of new niches, we end up in, uh, you know, we're following, we're serving maximal entropy production. That's what it means to order the internal uh, components of a system is it's exporting disorder. And so what do you get? You get this, you get a fractal distribution where at the edges of, you know, like, like in an extremely complex social environment like in New York City, you have orders of magnitude more jobs, more more you know more occupational niches, and so you know as human society becomes larger and larger, 
um, and our technological infrastructure becomes deeper and deeper, we're going to end up in situations where we're capable of being a speaking population of one and and, and not reliant. being able to communicate with anybody else because your language is so specific. And when you look at the idea of, you know, what words people share, you know, the the sixth grade lexicon is, you know, a thousand, few thousand words, right? You get to end of high school, you, you know, go up in order of magnitude, graduate, you know, bachelor's degree, graduate school, suddenly you're up to like, you know, 20,000, maybe, you know, you, the more you specialize, the more specific language you use, you know, you end up having 50, 60,000 potential words in your brain for very specific things, but nobody else, except for that one person who also studies the thing that you study is going to have all of those words in their brain. And that's why academic communications are so different from the communications to any other population of people. But as we're doing this, as you're, as you're, as you're discussing this, you know, we're going to, this is the way academia kind of works. It's niche, 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 niche. Everybody specialized, 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 but you have to have people who are interdisciplinary because when you end up on a spaceship of, you know, 10 people, <laughs> You have to be an engineer and a scientist and a, you know, <laughs> a, you know, also uh, somebody who can do language and pilot a ship all at the same time, which is, you know, similar to our current astronauts, cosmonauts, whomever. But I don't know. I I think this is fascinating because what you're talking about is that with artificial intelligence, it will allow humanity to follow and those individuals who want to follow their goals of certain specific instances to their, as far as they can take them, it'll allow that to be more possible as opposed to, um, or because the AI will be able to communicate those specific things to other groups of people in a, in a better way based on context, once context, context is understood. And right now within the entire science communication, like academic community and professional community, people are like, dude, oh my God, we gotta worry about like how to talk to different people in different ways. And so now like, you know, if you're people who are training scientists how to talk about their work, they're like, no, you cannot just say the same thing all the time. People aren't going to understand it. <laughs> that was my purgatory for four and a half years at the Santa Fe Institute, as you know. You're not that, get it. I mean, I was, I was, it's, so it's funny again, I don't, you know, I don't mean to keep leaning on this book, but in, in Blindsight, Peter Watts, it's a the great character book. you follow yeah. in that book is Siri Keaton, Siri, like the, you know, the Apple AI uh, assistant, uh, or rather just assistant. But at any rate, Siri Keaton is basically... Uh, the science communicator for the scientific first contact mission and is stuck in the position of having to, to translate between scientists with radically different transhuman brain anatomies. And so he's making a kind of a caricature of our situation, but it's a very plausible caricature. Um, and of course, all of the scientists think that he might be a spy and he's, he's, you know, you get into exactly the same kind of problem that we're talking I'm about, sorry, which is expert you can identification. Talk to too many, yeah, you can talk to too many people. You've got to be a spy. <laughs> right. Right. And as, it's funny because, you know, it's something I think about a lot with respect to the, the kind of translational work that, that you and I do is uh, Brian Eno. Cause like I, I love, I make uh, ambient electroacoustic guitar music for Would fun. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, music and, for airports. Yeah. Eno is a huge inspiration. <laughs> and Eno said back in the 90s, uh, Eno, Eno and, and Kelly and uh, uh, a couple others that have come up in the course of this uh, were members of the Long Now Foundation, where I worked for a while, you know, thinking about long term thinking, long time cycles. Anyway, um, Eno, who coined the term the Long Now and the Big Here, you know, as, as prompts to get people to think on a larger scale. Uh, said in 1995 in an interview with Kelly for Wired magazine that the 
in the 21st century, the dominant art form would become curation because as network technologies take over, each of us finds ourselves in this position of intermediation. We find ourselves as the node on some path across the network. And every one of us is responsible for uh, translation to some degree in our lives. You know, the, the, the network doesn't really have an edge. You know, we've, we've closed the frontier of geographic exploration around the world. Some of yeah. us, as my, my friend Stephen Phipps in, in college said, no man is an island, but some of us are very long peninsulas. <laughs> Meaning that you're at the edge of <laughs> the statistical right. distribution. You know, yeah. you study worm <laughs> sex or whatever. But like, nonetheless, uh, all yes. of us are living in the network. And so, yeah, I mean, this is not the answer to your question. The answer to your question is, is AI uselessly vague? And I think that it is. Jaron Lanier yeah. said as much. You know, he said that using the word AI makes conversation about this more of a religion than anything else. And, yep. and I, I it makes it agree. easier for people like the head of uh, OpenAI to like do his marketing speak. Like I've seen so many things. If I'm blanking on his name because I've purposefully been trying to forget it. Um, but <laughs> what's his Sam name? Altman. Sam Altman says, yeah. this is the best thing to do. Sam Altman says we need nuclear fusion to be able to do the energy for the AI. Sam Altman says these are the nine things you should eat to be healthy today. Sam Altman says this is what you should read today. I'm like, this is one of those things where my mind is like, I'm done because the marketing speak mm. is taking over and the sensationalism sensationalism of all of it is like i said it's um turning it into meaningless right it's it doesn't mean ai means nothing well you've hit the other you know you've you've you, it's carrying <laughs> capacity right and that, that's yeah. the thing is like i've as as a quote unquote paleontologist futurist i've spent most of my adult life critiquing this Ray Kurzweil kind of ex sup exponential extrapolation into infinity, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, sorry, I took Ecology 101 and I know about this thing called carrying capacity and negative feedback and natural limits. And I'm not necessarily suggesting that, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends that are kind of like, uh, you know, degrowther types that believe we, you know, that we've crossed the carrying know. capacity of our planet but that's oh, yeah. years ago that came out as a right 1971 a, a, limits to growth yeah but here's the thing is that um this the singulatarians have it partially correct because uh back when i was at sfi i interviewed uh, ming jian lu who is uh, studied i love that you brought up being a rhizomal network <laughs> mycorrhizae of podcast right? world Yes. Ming Zhen Lu studies the evolution of plant fungi symbiosis and mycorrhizal affiliation. And, and in the conversation that he and I had for Complexity Podcast episode 80, uh, that. Did you, did uh, you just have those like episodes and interviews on the top of your head? Like you just. Yes, which is why it's always better to talk to me than it is to talk to the bot. But. Um, <clears throat> okay, but, keep I mean, going. My brain anyway, is so. Yeah, so Ming Zhen. Uh, and I talked about how there was a time uh, that, the, you know, the Carboniferous period, a lot of the fossil fuel deposits that we have today uh, exist uh, in because of algae. But a lot of them exist because there were millions of years where the terrestrial ecosystems of Earth were uh, defined, were characterized by fallen logs that nothing knew how to eat. There was nothing in the There's world. Nothing that could there to keep no decomposers. Right. No decomposers. And yeah. so what, you know, and you go back even further, and this is this is something I've been thinking about for much longer than awesome. you know, since I, you know, talked to Ming Zhen, but like, you know, the great <laughs> oxidation event of 2.2 billion years ago was uh, a, 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 an atmospheric industrial pollution catastrophe. Yeah. You know, so like if you know, if you talk about AI, like the thing that I like to do yes. is say, okay, well, this word is let's let's give this word more meaning by deconstructing what it means to be artificial even more than we already have so artificial intelligence doesn't mean the specific thing artificial intelligence could mean the intelligence that is the result of the agency of some other kind of intelligence and arguably therefore one might conclude that the 
atmosphere that we take for granted as is artificial natural, is, to the planet. Is, it was engineered, however by, unwittingly, by cyanobacteria okay. and the or, the microorganisms that had to evolve an oxygen based metabolism in order to adapt to a uh, an overproduction of oxygen. And so yes, everything is that you you are breaking my double stranded DNA and my hippocampus <laughs> right now. Oh my god! But yes. Everything is that kind of adaptation, right? They're like you talked about, they're the phase transitions, right? There are points at which conditions change that lead to it's we can call it an opportunity, but it's also necessity. If something is going to survive, it is necessary, not just sufficient for that organism to continue doing something in a particular way or to adapt to a different way, which leads to new speciation and the, you know, the mutation and the evolution of, uh, through complexity, right? The, you know, right. you have the randomness, you have the complexity, certain things work in certain situations, don't work in other situations, you know, but you have that multiplicity of factors that all come together to push in a particular direction. Nothing would be the way it is without the way it was, right? But we call it natural now. Um, people on marketing stuff, they call it organic or natural, quote unquote. But, um, <laughs> well, yeah. Douglas Adams said that, you know, it was like, uh, <laughs> he said, uh, you know, everything, every new technology invented after the age of 35 is against the natural order. <laughs> you know, like anything invented when you're a kid is just like, I mean, oh, you know, like it's just your invention. But, it's, right. it's what you're right, doing. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, you know, in that sense, there is no, there is no such thing as the supernatural. There may be all kinds of weird stuff that we, we would currently characterize as supernatural. And I find that sort of, you know, fringe science, I find very fascinating for that reason, because it's, it, you know, we have very good reason to maintain epistemic humility at a time when knowledge production is so incredibly uh, over the top that, you know, everyone is having a hard time keeping track of what we know. Um, okay. But yeah. Yeah. And on that, I want to ask you, um, as, as someone who is asking questions and wants to cross different intellectual uh, field barriers uh, for creativity, for philosophy, for also knowledge and intellectual advancement. Like, how do you balance the fact that there is so much uh, manipulation and misuse of information that's out there uh, with the ultimate like humanity of cr knowledge creation and the, the the fact that you have to be creative and you have to allow for pushing barriers in the process of creating new knowledge especially as someone who communicates science yeah i mean well i'm i'm off the hook now i'm no longer tethered to an institution to an, uh, right right you're you're i have you're, you're I've on internalized, your own <laughs> i mean i've internalized the super ego of the santa fe institute now and and now Future Fossils is a different show than it was in 2018 when I started working there. You know, now I'm much more careful about the kind of stuff that I that I entertain. Right. Uh, and in fact, you know, if you go Future Fossils episode 186 is my manifesto for weird science, and I, I you know, this is the this is where I say we, you know. Uh, we need to be careful. I forget her name. Here's your forgetting. I, I, I spoke a couple years ago in a, an SFI working group with a University of Colorado philosophy professor whose name I forget, and I'm sorry. Um, but she said, you know, we have to be careful about premature ontological closure. You know, like the more you know, the better you get at convincing yourself of you whatever it is that you are uh, politically motivated to believe uh, stuff to blow your mind did a great episode on this about, about the politics ridden mind. Um, yeah. And my favorite, and so, my yeah. favorite quote is from, uh, I always forget things. Anyway, my favorite quote, you know, nothing, Jon Snow. So yes. <laughs> it just is so 
specific, but also it's just a reminder that like the more you learn, the less you know. And I mean, I honestly think that my PhD was ultimately important to me because that is the most important thing it taught me. Mm. There were always more things to learn. There were. I think it had a different no effect on you than it has answers. a lot on a lot of PhD <laughs> students. Ew, because no, at some just, point you become politically me. motivated to believe that you're an expert. And, you know, Murray Gell-Mann used to talk about, I mean, so like Michael Crichton was friends with Murray Gell-Mann. And uh, Crichton coined this term, the Gell-Mann amnesia, which is when you read an article in the newspaper on a topic that you are well acquainted with, and you realize the journalists don't know what they're talking about, but then you turn the page and you're reading an article about a different topic and you immediately forget that what you're reading is not the canonical truth about some situation. And, and so I think that this is, if I'm going to recommend one extremely weird piece of reading to your listeners to help them understand where my head's at with this question of, you know, how do we stay grounded in a time that is so vertiginous and and in certain ways, you know, really quite scary because the bottom has fallen out of of consensual, you know, of, of consensus reality. You know, like reality. Friedrich Nietzsche, yeah. you know, talked about that. You know, that when he was saying God is dead, um, he wasn't he wasn't bragging. He was pointing into the epistemic abyss of and of nihilism and the existential abyss of what does it mean now that we have uh, we've we've crossed into the realm where there be tigers and dragons and we no longer have this mythic envelope, you know, the, uh, the, the uterus or the, I mean, the placenta of, of Christianity to protect Western science. You know, what does this mean? To the, our placenta is full of microplastics now. Jeez. Oh God. So, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, that's the whole thing. Um, but, but there are bacteria now evolving to eat the plastics, right? So yeah. there's hope. And, and, I, you know, that's, that's the Ming Jin Lu hope. You know, close Curiosity. the close the circle. Let's bring it in. But so yes. yeah, so this the story that I, I want to recommend people uh as sort of street cred. Uh I, I wrote this thing in, in 2017 called An Oral History of the End of Reality. It was right after I saw Adobe give the first product demo for their new voice cloning software, where you could take a at that time it was a two-minute sample of someone's voice and then create something that sounded like a reasonable approximation of that person. You could type in words and it come out sounding like a, and now this is a retail consumer product and you only need like three seconds or something. To, six. To, it's, it's, I think it's six Well, it was seconds. five. Uh, or, the, the, uh, it may be shorter now, but yeah. Yeah, the Google, <laughs> yeah, it was five as of 2020. But I mean, so this is one of these, you know, Gib William Gibson says the future is already here. It's just distributed unevenly. Who can really stay on top of everything? Um, I tried for a little while staying on top of AI news and it's impossible. Yeah, so this this story is is about the collapse of social epistemology that we are living through right now in 2024, an era of uh, where <clears throat> the arms race between our ability to synthesize convincing forgeries that that trick those of us that are used to relying on photographic uh, or you know videographic evidence as what R York University professor U Regina Rini calls the epistemic backstop of yep. the last 150 years, that's gone. If you can and, see it, you you can you can know it, right? That's gone. Right, right, and so. Yeah. Um, and this is only going to progress. And so there's this arms race now between uh, counterfeiting and, and forgery. And what are we left with? Like, what is the, the evolutionary game theoretical, uh, you know, equilibrium that if you run this long enough, where does it leave us? And it was interesting because like a lot of the people who read the story wrote to me and they were just terrified. You know, um, mm -hmm. but a couple of people who it's read the story realized that uh, where I see it taking us is back into this uh, acceptance that, you know, if you come out of like, as you did, if you come out of a scientific training with uh, a, you know, well adapted to, uh, 
to, to the scientific process rather than just, you know, assuming you're an expert for status primate reasons, um, then you become much more careful about the way that you state a claim. And so, you know, what I, what I saw is, and what I think I'm starting to see with, you know, people uh, working in this space are starting to devise human computer chimerae, uh, you know, like my friend uh, Nicholas Brigham Adams at Goodly Labs, who is a social scientist who leads a group of people working on human AI collective intelligence uh, scaffolds. Um, I interviewed him on, on Future Fossils a couple episodes ago, and we talked about, uh, you know, rest in peace, Daniel Kahneman. Uh, no, that, just, you know, thinking yeah. fast and slow, system one and system oh, two. So, yeah. thinking. You know, so like yeah. okay, what we have it now is. on the Internet is like reflex thinking. Uh, what we need is executive function. We need a, a planet scale prefrontal cortex. And and so what I am, what I kind of imagine and what I hint at in an oral history mm. of the end of reality is that we develop more nuanced ways, ways that might include uh, um, you know, th that make use of the, the fact that the, that the internet is dynamic in its presentation, you know, mm -hmm. that, uh, that we, we're not, we're not, uh, you know, so much of science and journalism chaotic. now is still operating in a regime where it's like you have a hammer press with fixed type, you know, and we're worried that you can go back and you can change what this stuff says, but actually, you know, what we need to be able to represent knowledge in a way that is itself adaptive to the extraordinary pace at which new knowledge is, is produced. And, and also it's, a, it, it communicates the uncertainty with it, with which scientists are actually making their claims. So like if you had a high, yeah. if you had a high uh, P value in your research, maybe the, the typeface in which this news is reported would be blurrier in the places where there's greater levels of statistical uncertainty in the results. And they would come into focus as you're saying something that the researchers are more confident in saying, you know, and, and, and so this is, you know, there's going to be a, a many, many, many different ways that we address this issue, but I, I'm, I'm actually rather hopeful because mm -hmm. as someone who has been, you know, who, who basically, uh, fell on the sword of institutional <laughs> science communication. Um, I want right. what better am I ways. doing? <laughs> right. I dream, I dream of better ways for us to to communicate honestly with one another yeah. where you feel that you know something for sure and where you're hesitant to report your findings instead of like yeah. the way that we see this stuff in you know sensationalist ad revenue attention economy science journalism Headlines. which is click, click, this click, is click. the new reality adapt yeah. and it's creating this problem that you know which is is that people say you know like believe the science and it's like no 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 that's that's a very 14th so, century way right, of talking so there's about two this. different like there's 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 now like you talk about game theory i think uh in the internet with respect to scientific information there's there is uh i have an open mind I I I have an open mind, so of course I'm still asking questions, and no one knows. I don't know. No one knows. I still, you know, what? Versus believe the science, which is like the other side of it. So, I think that there is a, a there is something to be addressed there in terms of the information distribution related to science on the internet. I mean, maybe just misinformation and information itself generally, but. Um, I think the point also that you brought up about uncertainty is something that we need to address more. More and more often, there are studies that support the idea that people need to understand that science has uncertainty and that not that most results, the majority of results, are not certain, that there is a distribution, right? There, <laughs> we have significance, and then we also have uh, standards of error, around that you know but that's the statistics right people don't like the broader general public they look at the headline and they go okay great got it now i know if the you news program 
if you're if you are a coder in the audience, let's talk because what I want to see are different overlays. Um, you know, data visualization. I want to see a heat map on a scientific article. You know, you can see this now with gaze tracking in the Apple Vision Pro and this kind of thing. You can see how long someone's eyes lingered on a particular, you know, the the decolletage of some swimsuit model. Um, what I want to see is, uh, I want to see a heat map for the the uh, relative degrees of uncertainty of different statements made in mm. a scientific paper. I want to see, for instance, I want to see- Not would even be just scientific papers, but like the media that's going right. on. So that, you know, as you're looking at your, uh, your phone browser or your computer browser, if you have allowed this to be measured, you know, then this data, your webcam will be measuring where your eyes are, right? on the screen for a particular amount of time? What are you paying attention to? What are you looking at? And then is there a poll that you can take at the end of those articles or whatever you're looking at that determines uh, your um, your sensory aspects or like how you feel about whatever it is? So yeah, you can do like Peter Sheridan Dodds at the University of Vermont, again, yeah. you know, uses uh, Twitter timeline data time series data analysis to study uh, sentiment change over time. You know, the way- That was the word has, I was looking has, for. Yeah, he has really interesting tools online uh, that you can, you can see the frequencies of different words in a population of words on Twitter and see how they change over time and see how they change uh, relative to one another. And you can, you can track happiness in terms of like you can track the emotional you know thermometer of twitter over more than a decade and uh but even more so like and we're not happy generally oh no it's actually it's, it has gone precipitously down, <laughs> it's down. Um, yeah. and there's a question of how much uh, of it you know how what so that's where you get you know what is happiness form, what is the, the hypothesis what does yeah. it mean yeah. for us to have like we know that these correlations are real now what um, but even mm -hmm. more so, like it would take very little. There's a, there's a, a, I'm really fascinated by this approach in the digital humanities called topic modeling, which studies uh, clusters of associated uh, concepts by taking, for instance, uh, my, uh, I, I've had a number of conversations with Simon Dedeo at Carnegie Mellon University about this. He he looks at the French parliamentary papers. He looks at the history of the proceedings of the Royal Society. Uh, and I find his work and like the work of Lauren Klein, who looks at, uh, she wrote a, a book with Catherine Dignalio called uh, Data Feminism that looks at things like the abolitionary newspapers and tracks the contributions of black and female authors who are writing under aliases or like, you know, we've, we now who know. Who had to write under ideas. aliases. Exactly. But otherwise we can they would track, not have been accepted. Yeah. We could track the ideas that were coming up with people that were not being given credit for them at the time. And we can actually see where the innovations were being made in culture. And I think that you could do something, you know, it would be very easy given the, the methods that we have now that we've had for years to do something similar with a uh, scientific publication or, you know, and then we could, we could put that into, into science reporting where you can see how long something has been a fact you know that you could see the 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 patina of of you know the the depth of empirical validation that for an idea it, that is interesting that i i am interested in that and how that could be utilized um for not just for scientists themselves for the direction of the research that they're taking but also for communicators and how things are communicated and also to help people understand what is consensus versus a new idea versus, you know, this is just, this is quote unquote, just theory. <laughs> if, if you have money and you're listening to this fund me and Kiki to put together a team of software developers who will change it. scientific communication oh for God. the better for Millions oh. and millions of people. 
that we can revolutionize the way that people understand the process of knowledge construction. And we can make our society a much, much safer place because people will not be arguing over as many of the wrong things anymore. Oh my gosh. Like, yes, 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 yes. Like how can we use the tools that we have today to enhance and improve the way that we co-create the future, right? We have the tools now. We're going to create the tools of the future, but we have to work it to make it work better. (laughs) Yes. Funding, please. I think that we can do this. (laughs) And in fact, like I said, I I know, like, oh my gosh, I love it. (laughs) I know the people that could be building these models. It's just a matter of finding the means to hire them. Yeah. So let me just talk to Rita Allen. You know, I'll see what I'll I'll see what Rita Allen wants to do. (laughs) I mean, there are a lot of people that. I mean, this is a this is a concern. We live in the so-called post-truth era, but that was a premature diagnosis. That was premature in the same way that people diagnosed postmodernism in the middle of the 20th century. And we are, by all accounts, still quite firmly embedded in the modern era. Um, We we are not yet post-truth. We are not uh, end-stage capitalism, possibly, Uh, probably. But uh, yeah, we diagnose ourselves very early, but there are ways that we can use our resources and our knowledge and collaborate for the better. Michael, you have just been amazing to talk through, talk to, and it's been a couple of hours. So um, as much as I want to keep speaking with you about all of these things, um, <sighs> We need to bring the show to a close. So you have mentioned your podcast and um, other things, but where can people find out about things that you're working on? And is there anything like specifically right now that you want to let people know about that's going to be coming up? I mean, certainly I, uh, like I said, I'm trying to find time to write a book about all of this stuff. Uh, Future Fossils is ongoing. I am... Uh, making do with a, a day job for a, uh, a really interesting uh, computing nonprofit that I can't really talk about yet, but it is. Oh, secrets. Uh, That's cool. It is. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of this, a lot of this stuff comes out of research that I've background research I've been doing uh, for a, a team of, you know, if I'm going to put my money on a horse, as far as, you know, what it means to have a, a much healthier paradigm for for computing and for you know human computer symbiosis. But no, I would just say, look, get, get in touch with me if you find this stuff interesting. Um, I have a link tree, Michael Garfield, with a lot of the the stuff we've been talking about up top. But yeah, I mean, I'm I'm uh, I'm co-facilitating a course on technology ethics uh, later this spring. You know, what does it mean to to wield these kinds of technologies in a responsible way. Um, I, I have an album coming out right now, week by week. I really thank you for- Right, <laughs> week by week. This was great. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it was, I, I spent 20 years on this thing, but the right way to release it these days is apparently as a drip. That's the way you maximize attention capture surface area. So, you know. Yeah, that's that's the uh, the course embodied ethics in the age of AI, um, with uh, co-produced by uh, Andrew Dunn, who's the the former uh, innovation head for the Center for Humane Technology. You know, Tristan Harris's organization, mm-hmm. um, and we've got yeah. So I mean, there's just a lot. There's a lot at any time, but I I uh, I'm always looking for another interesting team to be a part of. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to speak with anyone who thinks I can help them navigate the, uh, what my, my friend and mentor Eric Davis called global weirding. (laughs) It is, it is a weird time and we find ourselves in it. And if we can uh, work together and talk to each other as we go through it, perhaps it will not 
seem as lonely and maybe the weird will be the good kind of weird instead of the kind of weird that uh, you're like, I don't know if I really like this very much. (laughs) I hope so. I'm here to help. Last thing I'll say about this, and this is, this is me being truly weird, but um, Bring it. I like the weird. I'm a weird. As someone who thinks in networks about (laughs) networks, across networks of networks, uh, you know, one of the ideas that I'm playing with that I want to explore in in this book, Jurassic Worlding, that I need to find a publisher for and pitch, um, is I'd know if there's anybody out there who wants. Yes, are you a publisher? Um, (laughs) I need an advance. Um, Yes. No. the, uh, The idea is that. The, the network map of the internet as it has developed over time looks rather similar to uh, maps of functional connectivity in the human brain under the influence of psychedelics. And like what you found through studies. And not like the spider webs of spiders on psychedelics. Right, right. right. Well, there's that whole thing too, which is hilarious. Um, A very fascinating kind of, uh, you know, bedroom study on, on the extended cognition. But um, no, there was, there was, you know, the, the research that's been done on psilocybin in the brain at Imperial College London shows that, uh, that psychedelics relax the, the inhibition of crosstalk between brain regions. And, you know, in a similar way, the evolution of humans, tech, uh, of our, you know, communications technology infrastructure um, can be kind of seen as uh, the same kind of process with the same kind of promise and the same kind of peril. And, you know, so, you know, if you lean too far in one direction, if you over con- if you connect things too much, you get cascading bank failures and the spread of zoonotic plagues and proliferation of disinfo and all of these other things. That's um, the bad, that's a bad, the bad place. <laughs> Right. So like to your point about like, (laughs) where is the level, you know, this, this question of how connected should we be? um, You know, how, how much information should be moving through, you know, from one part of the system to another? Um, You know, this is, this is a question that I find very fascinating, but, you know, my friends who work in the festival world, you know, we started talking about Burning Man. My friends who work at Burning Man in the Zendo, which is the harm reduction center where people go when they're having a bad time, um, mm-hmm. you know, I they have my my years long friendship with them has given me a, a metaphor that I find very useful to me in thinking about how to help people make sense of an age of exponential technological change, which is that we are basically living in some in some kind of way, we are living through something like a planet scale psychedelic experience. And the question is, how can we make it a good trip? (laughs) Or if we are having a bad trip, how can we help someone integrate that experience so that it at least becomes a valuable lesson? Don't burn out folks. No, thank you. Okay. I'm just thank you. Yes. I'm gonna take that. I'm giving you claps. That I love that as a as a take-home message for the night. Yeah. Just how can we turn it into a good trip? How can we help the people who are having a bad trip? How can we make this trip <laughs> really, really that transformative experience that a psychedelic trip can and uh i don't know don't want to judge but should possibly be don't doesn't necessarily necessarily have have to be Uh, michael thank you so much for joining us tonight here on this week in science and i will share your link tree it's going to be at our twist.org show notes it'll be on our website it'll be shared in our social media after the fact um and all the information about stuff that we talked about. If there's a, do you have anything else that you, you need us to know links, anything else that we should have? No. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about the, the web as it currently exists, right? Is that you actually don't need the links. You just know where to find me. 
because you just yeah. do the thing. You just do the thing okay. and you find that guy, you know. Michael Garfield, the although unfortunately, um, <laughs> there's probably some other weird, Michael Garfields out there that the get weird confused. Twist, <laughs> the weird twist is that there is a radio personality in Houston, uh, Michael Garfield, who reports on technology for iHeartRadio. He's the high tech Texan. And for all the years that I was living in Austin, but Texas, that's not you. I was like, what is this? What weird, like, what is this actually, you know, what's in a name? Like how, you know, uh, Dennis's are m more likely than sh would be expected from a, ra a random, uh, and from like a normal distribution oh my to become dentists. Mm -hmm. Laura's are more likely than would be randomly expected to become lawyers. Mm -hmm. So what mm -hmm. is it about Michael mm -hmm. Gardner that says you're going to be talking about technology? I don't know. It's probability, man. It's all statistics. It's spurious. Yes. You might be an outlier. I don't know. Oh, my goodness. Everybody out there, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. Michael, thank you once again for joining us. Everybody, Future Fossils podcast. If you are interested in hearing more of Michael talking with all these people that he has named and uh, referenced throughout the show about all these in interesting topics and more. He has many episodes and his Substack is really awesome. Not just the, not just the podcast. There's a lot of writing and there's a lot of other stuff and it's music and so much out there. Oh my gosh. Michael, we need to connect more because these ideas are amazing. You, you made my brain happy. And I Our hope collaboration is as destined as multicellularity, given <laughs> the thermodynamic <laughs> gradient. There we go. <laughs> Particular things have to happen to make it work, but then all of a sudden, there it goes. Exactly. Everybody out there, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. If you going to come back again make sure you come back again next week we'll be here but I, right now oh my gosh all of you chat rooms thank you for being here chatting discord youtube facebook twitch thank you for all of your comments and all of your ideas throughout the conversations that we've had tonight i would love to give shout outs also to fada for his help with social media and show notes Gord, Arnlor, others who help keep our chat rooms really nice places to hang out thank you for making sure that happens Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And Rachel, thank you for your editing. And of course, as always, I do need to thank our Patreon sponsors. So without further ado, thank you to Aaron Anathema, Arthur Kepler, Craig Potts, Mary Gertz, Teresa Smith, Smith Richard Badge, Bob Coles, Kent Northrop, George Chorus, Pierre Velazarb, John Ratnaswamy, Chris Wozniak, Vigard Chefstad, Donathan Stiles, aka Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Regan Shu, Brood, Sarah Forfar, Don Mundus, PIG, Starrett, Stephen Alboran, Daryl, I can't talk tonight, Daryl Myshak, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Runovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, David and Youngblood, Sean Claire and Slam, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Kessenflow, Steve Leesman, aka Zima, Ken Hayes, Harrod Tan, Christopher Rabin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Hami Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul Rick Remus, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, Lon, Makes, E.O., Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Bob Calder, Marjorie Paul D. Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, and Tony Steele. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. <sighs> I really, really cannot do all of this without you. And if any of you out there are interested in helping us out by supporting on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link. On next week's show, I'm going to be back again at 8 p.m. Pacific time. Woo! Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, get ready. It'll be live once again. Want to listen to this podcast? Just look for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. And if you enjoyed the show, of course, get your friends to subscribe too for more information, links to stories, etc. Head over to twist.org and also sign up for our newsletter, which we occasionally actually send out because it's kind of me and I'm uh, not good at that. Anyway, <sighs> I love your feedback. If there's a topic that you want me to cover, us to cover, 
suggestion for an interview, let me know on social media or send me an email. Put twists in the subject line, however, so that your email doesn't get spam filtered into an AI algorithm, just turning it into a um, hallucination and that doesn't really go anywhere and isn't real anyway. So just, just put it there in the twist subject line. That's how I'll know that you're talking to me. And we look forward to discussing science with you again next week because, you know, we're going to be back again. And if you learned anything, remember, it's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science is the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop. Got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in. I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand Cause this week's science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science Science, science. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science. science. What a song. Yes, that song was produced by Neil Shirley and his brother, and they were uh, have been Twist fans for a very long time. I don't know if Neil still listens to the show even, <laughs> but uh, he and his brother uh, created the song for the show, and I didn't even ask them for it, and they said... Here you go. And I, it was so many aspects of the show that are fantastic. And yes. I might have to. You might have to run now. No. I might. No, I was going to say I do have to pee. But I was like, I might have to write you a song. <laughs> you could write me a song. You already did once. It was on, well, a, that was, that it was on a compilation happened. years ago. It just happened to be a song that I had. <laughs> that wasn't like. Spit thinking about you and writing words anyway wow i hope that um twist music is always I hope, appreciated i hope i'm not burned at the stake i don't know who <laughs> listens to your show but like i think about this like damian walter who, who runs the science fiction podcast you know his his mm -hmm. audience is like um this like very sort of um aspy engineers like bro like sci-fi fan kind of thing yes. that really like he he constantly struggles with his own audience because i've never been there so <laughs> yeah no there is a a line that is very interesting and just uh speaking to everyone in the audience uh right now it i appreciate everybody for the time that they you spend here with us for the conversation and for the patience that you have when you know something about topics and you want us to be speaking about it more specifically than we actually are. Um, or if you're like, ah, you're so in the weeds, get out of the weeds. Some, uh, let me know what's important actually. And that's the balance, but I've had over the years, so many emails from people who want this show to be more specific and detailed and not not personality talk show kind of thing um but at the same time the people who have been with the show and who like the show who who are here right now and who have been with us for years they enjoy the conversation and the fact that it's there is this information and we're curating it but like you said, you know, back to the curation point from earlier, we're curating the information, but also making it interesting in a way that potentially uh, leads them to new different thinks and thoughts, right? So it's not just sharing information and knowledge, but it's like helping, it's, 
it's the conversation. It's the people talking about it. And it's the way we talk about it. So I don't know. It's, um, it's a balance. I could get nitty gritty, but I really, I, I like being able to be me and not just a host. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I don't even know. I think when I was, when I started listening to you, you were still a student. Yes. And, you know, I remember like the first it time you were like, took oh, me a I while am, to figure it out. I am. Uh, I, you know, I when when you were like, I have a PhD in neuroscience now. I was like, the fuck, you know, like <laughs> what? Like, right. I mean, and it's funny because like you and you and my friend Jessica Nielsen got your neuroscience PhD is around the same time. And I met Jessica because I was I the first time I ever gave a public science talk was at Burning Man. Ah. Um, and I've it was never so, talked science at Burning Man. Oh my I, God. Always, I always hide it. I've always like, oh, hey, the... I'm just here. And people are like, who are you? And I'm like, I'm Kiki. And then everybody's like, okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> so yeah, here I'll send you. And then, I, and then I get deep and then they're like, what? <laughs> Not that I'm recommending you listen to this. <laughs> exactly. <sighs> um, but I do have all of my old... Burning Man talks. Oh my gosh! Um, and so, That's like, amazing. anyway, I'll, I'll you know I'll send you the link so you can have a bot do or whatever. Yeah, the but bot. Like, <laughs> but I, I gave. But I remember in two thousand nine, I gave this this talk on evolution uh, because that was the theme of the year was evolution, and I was like, I'm being called. You know, I have a degree, and they put me on a panel with uh, a, a, a several or like three other evolutionary biology graduate students. And I was talking okay. about psychoneuroimmunology and epigenetic adaptation. And they all thought I was fucking nuts. And but they were you all weren't like, because right now we just like one of my first stories today was psychoneuroimmunology. Hello? Right. And they, and they all were like, yes. they were like, no dude. No, dude, evolution doesn't happen within the time scale of a single organism. And I was like, okay, not genetic inheritance, but there is still an evolutionary market. And there, there's a, you know, like I wasn't using fitness landscapes and stuff, but I would have chewed them a new asshole if I had the language I have now. No. But like, Michael, but, no, but you were like, you were like, uh, I was so Darwinian for so long because of like, oh, well, this is the way it happens. And Justin was like, no. No, wait a minute. Hold on. What about the uh, uh, and I was like, no, no, no. And then but Justin was my foil constantly. And he really was respected right. about him. He was he was right. But I, you know, at the same time was able to, you know, that's the whole thing. Is like oh, oh uh, I had so much hubris as a grad student, you know, to think that I yeah. had learned all the things. Well, I mean, that was the thing was that it turned out that the work had, you know, when I got to SFI, it turned out that the work that I didn't even realize, like I was sitting there like taking notes on like self-organization of new complex structures. How does this happen? And then like, I know Stuart Kaufman now. And like, I didn't realize that there was, there had been like formal rigorous work done in this domain for, you know, decades. Decades. And yes. that none of these grad students knew it because they were all being systematically discouraged from asking big questions. Yep. And even I, at the time I had been, I had been, I had emailed SFI in like 2006 and they were like, we don't have a graduate program, go away. And so I, I forgot yeah. about them for 13 years. Um, I had, I had ideas in grad school that I wanted to pursue and nobody was working in those areas and my, yeah. And, no. Yeah, so it seemed a little yes. unfair, but I mean, no, but anyway. it, it was it was an immensely important opportunity, and and it, it was transformative and wonderful. Um, I think we have these anyway, experiences, to, right? Yes. Going back to uh, Burning Man in two thousand nine. Oh, sh my friend, that's a long time I met ago. my friend Jessica Nielsen at Burning Man after giving that talk because she came up to me and she said, "Where where are you, a professor?" Where are you, a professor? Because and I'm you're dying. like you're like I'm. She's like not. I'm. I am. She's like she was at uh, Irvine, UC Irvine. She's like I. 
I am losing my mind. I'm in my final year of my neuroscience PhD. I'm doing uh, rat spinal research. I have to kill rats for a living. And, yeah. and I'm being, bird you know, stuff. it's like, and I have to do this work that requires, uh, you know, that it's like, it's, it's about spinal regeneration and I care about this, but I, I can't have conversations like this. You know, like I'm an, I'm a, I'm an academic, I'm an intellectual and I can't, do this. Where are you? And I said, Oh, honey, <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I'm sorry, but first of oh, all, I'm I, younger I than you it. are. I... <laughs> Second of all, this is the first time I've ever spoken in public about anything. This is the first time I've given <laughs> a public talk. Cool ideas. Third, um, I have been sleeping on my friend's couch for six months of the last year. Um, <laughs> Fourth, I don't believe that there is an institution that would be fully comfortable with me saying all the stuff that I was saying today, no. including SFI. And it turned out, you know, SFI has has had to be, you know, has had to rein itself in considerably over the last few decades because, you know, it has prestige and it has, you know, it's, it's a different thing it. now than it was in the 90s. And there's this whole, you know, when you're starting an organization, there's the... Uh, inertia of the ideas and the people you're bringing together and what you're doing and getting, ah, oh, we're gonna make this happen. It's this great thing. Ah. But then suddenly you're an organization and then you have to have credibility and prestige and uh, maintain funding and not, you know, there has to be a, a place where you're not doing things that are going to hurt other rep organizational reputations. And, you know, there is this whole concept of, you know, reputation uh, transfer or, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, developer, developer, yes, hello, I see you there. We are here and you can see you in the comments. Um, and why have we evolved to have emotions? It's most likely because we are social species and emotions allow us to uh, interact with other organisms and other individuals. And also uh, fear. This is a big one. Anger, another big one. Help us uh, survive because we fight for survival. Uh, love ish or lust. That's going to be procreation. Um, there's all sorts of other things objective, subjective, whatever. What is happiness? What is sadness? Whatever. But yeah. Um, emotions. Helen Fisher. Huh? Helen Fisher is the one that studies the, the, brain chemistry of love right yeah there's a, there are a few people she's got some really do. interesting work well i mean yeah but she's yeah. the one with the best publicist right that's the, <laughs> it's the one that gets interviewed the most like oh paul right. serino the guy that the dinosaur guy he's got two publicists um but yeah, yeah. No, helen fisher has some really good stuff on the you know what the 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 chemical differences between infatu infatuation and like the love that a you know my wife and I experience after being together for twenty years it's a it's a different beast. There is yeah, long term love is a very different thing than that short term lust based infatuation. Yeah, neurochemically, but also psychologically, physically, and we never talked about embodiment, which is like this whole other thing that I actually like really wanted to write a book about like years past, and then. This is my whole thing. I go, I'm gonna, this is amazing. I want to write a book about it. And then everybody else gets excited about it. <laughs> and I never write, I never do the thing. <laughs> you mean embodiment of intelligence? Yes, embodiment of how, okay, speaking of AI and uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, but if we're dealing with, a synthetic computer computing based algorithm algor algorithmic intelligence that is going to be uh, informed by whatever systems are coming into it but it is basically just going to be this intelligence in a box right we are a, an intelligence within a flesh sack that connects to uh, all of the biological, organic, inorganic stuff around us. 
through multiple ways. And like you were saying, we are able to take things in our environment and adapt them and use them as tools. A pencil is a way that we can uh, use a device to get our ideas out into the world, a stick in the sand. We can do the same thing. Um, you know, now we have computers. We have, you know, there's so many ways for us to get these ideas and our our thoughts externalized. Or we drive a car and we are able to embody the physicality of the structure of that car if you're a decent car driver um, as you're driving so that you know when you should stop. You know when, you, when you're merging or not merging and what's safe and not safe. Um, and so we, within our flesh sacks of sensory information, the way that our nervous system is made up and that our brain computes all of that information, um, even, you know, a quarter of a second after, <laughs> you know, we're conscious, we're conscious of it a quarter of a second after it actually happens. But the fact that we're able to use all the things in our environment in a way that we are connected to it suggests that there is no possible way that we can be human without being connected to the world or environment that we exist in. Because part of being human is interacting with it and manipulating it. That's just me. But anyway. No, I mean, totally. Although, you know, the question of like, you know, when I being at SFI for that long, I really, uh, it really wore a groove in uh, a conceptual frame that I already had going in and it really cemented for me, which was thinking about biology, not from a, a chemical uh perspective but from an information theor theoretical perspective and mm. so thinking about um you know like there's a couple of my favorite papers of all time are uh papers written or co-written by david krakauer and i didn't realize that he was actually the the you know I, like it had slipped my mind that he, I thought he was a lawyer well, there's there's a lot of crack hours, but like uh, the other big David crack hour is a is a jazz clarinetist. But, I mean, but, uh, I know this because I tracked the media alerts for five years. But no, the um, uh, David and his brother John, not the author uh, John, but the the uh, neuroscientist John. Uh, yeah. But D David was the co-author yeah, okay, okay. of the of the evolution of syntax stuff that I read in college by uh with martin nowak who was at princeton at the time with david and and then i you know i came in 2018 i said to david uh oh you know this stuff on the evolution of syntax he's like i co-authored that and i was like oh my god 13 years later i am working for the guy who wrote the paper that that knocked me out of my attractor basin of vertebrate paleontology and i ended up here and is that like what is that is that the workings of the machinations of destiny or whatever but um the point is that like his stuff is he wrote this paper called information theory of individuality with uh nihat i and, and jessica flack and a couple others and um and in that paper they you know they they kind of nod to alfred north whitehead and, and process philosophy saying that you define the boundaries of individuality by looking at mutual information between a system and its environment, information exchange between a system and its environment in space and in time. And mm. uh, you get gradients, you get a far more general definition of individuality that is not necessarily about life as we understand it, right? Uh, it's about uh, entropy and signaling and all this stuff. And uh, so what you have is like nodding all the way back to Ilya Prigogine, who did the work on dissipative structures and won the Nobel Prize for it in 1973. You have this. Your, refer your referential brain is like every time you say a name and a thing, I'm like. Well, I mean, this is I stuff I think about a lot. Stuff. I remember concepts and stuff. I have to look up the names and the dates. <laughs> I can give you my nootropic regimen. <laughs> You know, I do have baby brain, but I, I gobble um, blood flow enhancing brain 
vitamins. So I'm into B12. Um, I don't know. B12 is good. <laughs> Nuapept. Um, the the racetam group is helpful. Um, uh, bacopa, the herb bacopa. Um, you know, ginkgo biloba, ginseng, other things. Anyway, the point is that um, all the mushrooms, <laughs> all lion's mane, exactly reishi, all of that stuff. Um, it's sort of like to that, uh, it's almost like um, indigenous. You're like, well, the, the walnut looks like a brain and it's good for your brain. You know, mushrooms, if you want your brain to look like mycorrhizae, then do that. Um, but anyway, uh, so this is the thing. Um, Krakauer's, Krakauer et al, Information Theory of Individuality, says on the one end of this gradient, you have whirlpools, which have a consistent structure, but only to the degree that they're scaffolded by the environment. You move the rocks at the bottom of the riverbank and you get a different yep. shape. There mm -hmm. is no genetic inheritance, but there is inheritance over time. It's just entirely scaffolded by the environment. And on the other mm -hmm. end of the spectrum, you have purely genetic inheritance with no environmental scaffolding, which is a, a myth. It's like this Ayn Randian objectivist myth that yeah. you can be, you know, a totally, yeah. you know, self-authoring entity. Um, and so again, on both ends, like even a whirlpool, arguably on some very basement level physics kind of grain has information inheritance through time, right? Yes. So it's not DNA, but it is, the, like the quantum state of individual molecules being inherited over a time series. And then on the other end, you have this like really, really intense, uh, well-developed chemical inheritance mechanisms. Um, and so like the, the orthodox of biology until very recently was that only, like you said, there's Darwinian, only genetics. Um, but there's all of these other ways in which the general evolutionary theory works on non-genetic mechanisms. And in the middle of this, this gradient in, in an information theory of individuality, you have colonial organisms that mm. have some informational inheritance from their environmental scaffolding and, and some from uh, the time series. And this is the nature culture debate. Fundamentally, this boils down to how much of who you are is determined by conversations you're having with your friends and how yeah. much of it is the DNA that you inherited. And these things are inter, they, they occur across multiple levels because yeah. culture has its own sort of time, time-based inheritance. And you, it occurs across uh, different scales because your brain is learning at one rate and your culture is learning at one rate and your genetic lineage is learning at a different rate. And, oh, and man. So, like, so really, it's like eigenvalues. <laughs> yes, when it comes it's down to it, it's matrices and eigenvalues. Right, 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 right. And actually, this is the way that this is the way that their <laughs> their information is actually displayed in the figures of this paper. You see. Yeah. These. Anyway, so yeah, so and they said that we set out to do this because we wanted a fundamental theory <sighs> of individuality that was not dependent on. And this is how all the biology conversations worked. At SFI, they're like, we don't want to rely on the contingencies of a particular biochemistry, because what's going to happen is we're going to we're going to have to eat the humble pie when we find an alien race that's based on silicon or something. You know, it's, it's like, something different. Yeah, yeah. And so, but but mm -hmm. the consequence, the you know the the thing that you won't see SFI SciComm talking about very much uh, is that the actual you know, they're, they're willing to sort of entertain, oh, we might find an alien race that's made out of some, you know, whatever. But what what folks were much more confident, you know, much more comfortable talking about in like the seminars that didn't end up on YouTube was yeah. um, that, you know, Krakauer was like, was, you know, loved being like, by this definition, the blockchain is a living system. By this definition, the national constitution is actually, when we well, call it a living is... document, it, it's alive. Right. It's not I mean, alive in the way that you want to think about it, but it's alive. My buddy well, Jacob Also Foster, the idea you go to the, yeah. like, you know, the consciousness of the internet, you know, the fact that we have so many interconnected nodes. 
Mm -hmm. you know, is there a life uh, that actually exists beyond what we can comprehend because we have created all this interconnectedness already and we're just like these uh, little silly cells underneath it, right? This comes <laughs> up on Future Fossils all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, episode 178 idea, but... with Christopher Ryan, who's a paleoanthropologist who wrote a, fa a fantastic book called Civilized to Death. He actually has a, sh a popular podcast, you might know, Tangentially Speaking. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not really just a science show. It's like whatever he wants. But he wrote this book, Civilized to it's, Death, which I, I love. I need to do more of that, whatever and I want. He, yeah, you should. Um, <laughs> but you're going to have to have the Kiki show. It's going to be other. Um, right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and what you'll find is that a lot of people prefer. You know, when I left SFI, a lot of people, I wasn't allowed to talk about future fossils on the job. And. Right. A lot of people never found out that I had the show. That you switched, that, that you'd and had it and that it was and a I'd separate had it the thing. whole time. Yeah. And because um, SFI and was so, not a place where you were promoting yourself, you were promote. you were working right. to develop SFI's presence. And then right. so you also, yeah, the back and the forth. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's, get you know, that's reasonable. But, um, yeah. but the consequence of that is that when I, when I left, a lot of people were like, I wish you still hosted a podcast. And I'm like, oh, I, I have been hosting a podcast since the dawn of time, but uh, but not as long as Kirsten Sanford. She's I can't tell you the number universe. of people. When I left, uh, uh, when the show moved on from the This Week in Tech platform, where we were for just a short while, um, not the entire time, it was just a short while, but people were just like, oh, you're done forever even though i said i, I said we're going to keep going stay subscribe years later i have people going ah wait you're still doing this show <laughs> i I'm thought saying. it finished when you left twit and i'm like no the show was going before twit it went in during twit and it kept going after twit so it yeah. but you can't blame them right because no. No. Dunbar number brains living in a galaxy brain world. But anyway, the point is that like this, this, this Lovecraftian thing about um, my <laughs> Jacob Foster, who's a, a dear friend of mine who uh, runs the, with his wife, Erica Cartmill runs the diverse intelligence summer Institute mm. um, in Scotland. And it's amazing. They're, they're both uh, sociology professors at IU Bloomington now. They were at UCLA when I met them. And I met them through SFI um, because they were out there one year for uh, a, a workshop and for the Interplanetary Festival that they used to throw. That where I got to meet you that year, the same yeah, year in person. Year. You and I met at IP Fest 2019. Yes. So I met the same year I met you in person, finally, in Justin and Blair. I met Jacob and Erica. And Jacob gave a talk at this SFI uh, working group a couple of years ago now where he basically said, you know, he argued from an information theoretical uh, fundamental theory of living systems. We don't even call it biology, right? Because it's like, that's, that, that's, that word has some baggage, you know, it's living mm -hmm. systems, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from this position, one can argue that for instance, musical genres, and in particular, just for the fun of it, death metal is a kind of organism that in that lives on the substrate of human brains and propagates well that's through... going like to meme theory exactly like, but yeah. it provides a rigorous mathemat mathematical formalization for memetics hmm. that um that then becomes the gateway to some very for physicists profound... to think they know something about biology well, I mean, actually, you know, it's interesting because I mean, when, you know, cause I asked, I asked people at SFI, like, are you guys just, is this all just like a physics envy thing? And Krakauer's response, which took some while for me to actually like accept, but he's like, actually, no, this is biology infecting physics. Ooh. This is, this is the other okay. way around. I kind of, okay. This I kind of, I, I like that actually. Yeah, I need, I need so to Laurie with, Anderson. I yeah, so Laurie Anderson David. says language is a virus from outer space. <laughs> that comment is actually yeah. you can trace that back at least to William Burroughs, who came up with this the notion of language as a, a mind virus and his stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah. So there's this this idea has been around basically since Claude Shannon, because as soon as you start thinking about information theory, it's a very natural conclusion, and it's just taken decades for the mathematics to catch up as it always does. It always the artists get there first. They create a, a conceptual aperture through which something can be cognized well enough that it can be formalized in mathematics and tested empirically. Mm. And, you know, um, lots of people have written about this with the relationship between cubism and impressionism and relativity and, and quantum physics, you know, and, mm. and, and so then the, the science and engineering, Neri Oxman has the Krebs cycle of, of creativity, which talks, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah, I've seen that. The, the, yeah, this kind of thing where you see the, you know, stuff moving around. And this is kind of what I was talking about earlier about like, you got, you know, books and scientific papers on one end, you've got working groups and podcasts on the other end. And there's like high and low temperature moments in knowledge formation. Um, but yeah, so to all of that is just to say mm -hmm. that, that, um, you know, I have come around, to, you know, when you're talking about the super organism of the internet and the notion that, you know, maybe the planet is conscious. I've actually, you know, for, if you want, if people want to go into a rabbit hole, I've been having an all art, the way down. a debate with Bobby Azarian on Twitter recently. Bobby wrote The Romance of Reality, which is this, this kind of popularization of David Deutsch and, and the, you know, this, all this sort of complexity thinking, mm -hmm. but Bobby has a particular frame on it and I have a different frame. And, and where one of the areas that we differ is on, um, questions about consciousness and he he cl he calls himself a panpsychist but like um at any rate like you know we were talking about integrated information theory i i, I don't know how much you or the five people that are still listening to this know <laughs> two people that are still listening know about about integrated information theory More but, than five. uh tononi and coke uh and also uh eric howell um who's our uh our age, she's younger, um, contributed to this, uh, this theory about, um, applying information theory to neuroscience and the, and the study of, of consciousness. Howell's contribution was really interesting. He basically said that, uh, dreaming exists in order to prevent the brain from overfitting on memory. It's, mm. it, it's like, it's like, uh, mm. reservoir computing in machine learning. Um, yeah, so so Howell's work is it provides an information theoretical way of thinking about dreaming as having a particular evolutionary uh, fitness benefit, which is that it injects noise into the brain so that you don't so that, that there is room left for you to better model the unexpected. Um, but Tononi and Koch have this whole oh. thing about in IIT. Gosh, yes. IIT, yeah. which is one of the two leading scientific theories of consciousness. The other is global workspace theory, and they're yep. actually very similar. Mm -hmm. um, but IIT basically suggests that there's a measurement uh, fee, you know, or phi, however you pronounce it, um, that is a measure of the integration of information in a system that is their quantitative proxy for the 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 degree to which a system is conscious. Hmm. So it's the, it's the depth of the interiority of that system. And so they're making a very provocative claim that a lot of people have trouble with, which is that a thermostat is basically like a, has like a quantum. Right. So this is where the, this is, a, this is where the concept that a rock can have a certain amount of consciousness comes from. I mean, not a rock, really. No, a rock, sorry, there are, I mean, no, there. Well, are, this is where it like there are papers and people right. who have 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 hypothesized that mathematically, because of some of these, you know, these these equations and these ways mm -hmm. of looking at uh, uh, information theory from the quantum perspective of consciousness, that you know, any atomic material, therefore. Right has right. the potential to have a certain, you know, uh, quanta of consciousness. So right. a rock, well, it's not conscious in the way that we would describe it. It has the atomic, you know, blah, 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 whatever, you know, it's different from the way that our systems are set up to like be, have the awareness of, but I don't. Well, okay. So actually, um, 
Somewhat, yes, but like the the thing about a, a rock, the rock. So there's this whole thing in philosophy. There's heaps and holes, right? Arthur Kessler. Um, this is again with like process philosophy. Like Arthur Kessler coined this term "holon" to um, to to indicate an integrated thing that is both a whole unto itself and a part of something else. And in this case, a rock is not a holon. An atom. Yeah is a whole on a molecule is a whole on yeah um okay. but a rock mm -hmm. a rock really like the the i mean maybe a, like in a crystal you have something more closely approximating an actual individual whereas like a rock it it you know it's there the, the atoms inside a rock are not necessarily it depends on the, the is it metamorphic you know whatever but like a rock is I not think you are putting too many judgmental limitations on what makes a rock conscious or not based on this integrative theory but I don't know well this is actually I mean this is a point <laughs> this is a point of argument be, like be, like pan psychists are often making the, the point that you know what it is that we are not saying and like what they are saying is like like it is one thing to suggest that um it has to do with quantum measurement and like what what do we actually mean when we talk about the observer effect in quantum mechanics like um yeah you know like mm -hmm. okay it doesn't need to be a human the cat is obviously alive because the cat is observing the state of shred shred cat it's, it's <laughs> the cat is alive if a tree falls in the forest the tree knows because the trees actually communicate acoustically and and, and the species. mycorrhizae that it is right. integrated with underground right. and the plants communicate so the tree is not a lone tree by itself in the middle of nowhere falling down it's not it's no that's a forest. it's a horribly anthropocentric yeah. position and nobody yes. buys it nobody reasonable no. buys that anymore um yeah. but like no. the, the but now we're at the point where we can say like okay what does it mean when we animal vegetable or mineral what does it mean to have a mineral and that's my computer that's the mineral Your intelligence computer system. thumbs downing you well the, the laps no the, la, the the new macbooks have this like thing where occasionally they'll read your hand gestures and do some nonsense and it's i don't know how to turn it off um but yeah so like okay so um uh, anyway. you know there's a there's a complex <laughs> systems panpsychism uh, and the question is, how far down does it go? What does it mean? Uh, and the most reasonable panpsychist argument that I've read is that it has to do with this integrated information theory uh, kind of formulation where um, the like life never really emerged. What we call mm -hmm. life is a bundle of characteristics that have been accreted over time. Um, and if you talk to like, when I talk to Kate Adamala on complexity podcast, she studies synthetic cells in the laboratory and she's like, I've got cells that have a, a membrane. They reproduce genetically over time. In my yeah. opinion, they are still not alive in the way that I want to talk about alive in my, in my sense, like hmm. I've created these artificial cells, but I have still not created what I am willing to call life from scratch in the lab. But the Even fact though is they are surviving, way... reproducing, doing the heritability, like but she's done. She's done what almost any reasonable person would say. I've created life from. And she says I did chemical soup, and she's saying, "Well, you know, my definition of life has more qualifiers on it than your average person." Exactly. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of like this, you know. Yeah, to David Hu's point, or Hugh, uh, um, a lot of pre-modern traditions have uh yeah. you know an animistic perspective and the question is you know are we going to come back around to this and say whoops you know you were in the same way that that chemistry has come back around to a lot of folk medical wisdom that was denied when we burned all the witches you know are we going to come back around to animism and say whoops it turns out that you know it's completely reasonable to talk about crystals as having some kind of integrated information and therefore being, you know, minimally sentient according to the math and like, you know, so anyway, Eric, I chased you off. <laughs> you know, animism <laughs> is where we draw the line. Yeah. But, but I mean, night, but really, this, is, this is the provocative basement of this stuff. And the, and the question is, how does this help us answer some of the more fundamental questions in quantum mechanics, namely what constitutes an observation? Because Quantum physicists will tell you that you don't you don't need 
a complex observer. You don't need a human being for a system to observe itself. John Joe McFadden, <laughs> uh, who's a, a biologist at the University of Surrey, wrote a book um, about 20 years ago called Quantum Evolution, in which he proposes mm -hmm. that uh, where life, as we think of it, comes from, so, like self-reproducing molecules that evolve over time, um, where that comes from is, and why why it seems to have beaten the odds of the like tornado through a junkyard builds a 737 kind of st st apparent statistics against life. Boeing can't that, even build them these days. So anyway. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> they've automated their well, That's their what they're supposed to do. Oh, right. um, <laughs> so uh, jo John Joe McFadden proposes that what what life is in essence is a quantum computation and that why it seems like it beat the odds for chemical self-assembly is because most of the chemical self-assembly happened in a quantum superposition that in the process of recruiting additional materials from its environment in order to reproduce, basically assembled itself into a collapse of the superposed wave right. form. And, and <laughs> Robert Varner is saying bad quality control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, which I you challenge know, you Boeing Robert. versus, you know, yeah. quantum well, assembly. I mean, if but, I can't tell some of the comments Robert's made, I, I can't tell if he, uh, if he means that you letting yeah. me on the show is bad I think that's quality control. I think that's, I think that's Boeing. <laughs> oh, no, it really is. But, but I, I mean, but also it, a, it does, it does also, reflect on what you were just saying, which is this, uh, you know, the quantum superposition and the probability of certain states happening, occurring at certain times and places um, within certain environmental conditions, right? So that you have, uh, uh, we have certain uh, handedness to the molecular uh formation of organic molecules, right? Everything is one-handed. You know, we you can get left and right isomers for a lot of things, but they work better one way than the other way. And so um, there's this probability, you know, and there, there could be another uh, parallel universe where everything is the opposite handedness, right? Where if you were to show up there, you wouldn't be able to live because you couldn't get a blood transfusion because the handedness of all the molecules in their blood would kill you because <laughs> or they wouldn't, it just wouldn't help you at all because it wouldn't fit with the way our molecules do. Um, yeah, but it's all, it's it quantum stuff when I re when it really comes down to it is this superposition of infinite probability and the collapse of all of those functions into a particular state. And in the state of life, we had molecular conditions that enable, you know, that, hey, we have RNA, we have enzymes, we have this, we have things, oh, oh, oh. suddenly things work together and order came out of the chaos order fought the entropy and creating higher order, which is basically like holding the energy together, right? Like basically the fighting the thermodynamics of the entropy, the better that molecules could fight entropic forces, the better they stuck together. And then this ended up increasing complexity to, uh, using scavenging resources, right? And the scavenging of resources, then you have competition between different types of molecules, different types of collections of molecules, right? And then, so what was just fighting entropy chemically suddenly became inter-individual competition. And that competition led to the, the it, layer, 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 layer. And now we have this thing that is life that is this planet yeah actually that's that was Pete Adamala's point when I, I'm trying to post this in the chat 
<laughs> and I'm, it's not yeah. letting me for some reason. But episode 92 of Complexity Podcast is where I talk to Kate Automala about the papers that she's written about prebiotic inheritance and prebiotic Darwinian competition. Yeah. And it's exactly what you're saying. You know, some some molecules are just more likely to stick to a particular substrate. And then if you take that, um, if you if you follow that up into where you're actually talking about bilipid um, membranes and you know an aqueous solution containing you know some kind of molecule of inheritance, uh, Bruce Damer, a, a good buddy of mine, co-authored work at uh, UC uh, Santa Cruz with Dave Deemer on oh, I talked to Springs. Dave. Hey, Dave yeah. Deemer is great. Yeah, so they wrote this he's a, series he's of a papers wacky together dude. on the, the Hot Springs abiogenesis model yes. that made it to the cover of Astrobiology Journal. And as you know, I think is in my opinion, like the 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 front runner as far as like them working out the actual mechanics of how you get pop, you, life starts with entire populations of cells, actually. Yeah. You don't get a cell. You get this entire sort of mass uh, it's massive like phase, parallel it's, chemical it's like, experiment. Yeah, phase transition. Again, it has to be like the. It, we talk about mutations and how, you know, everybody's like, oh, individual mutations lead to change on the population level. And it's like, mm -hmm, just one person. And uh, no, a lot of people have to have similar mutations for those mutations to like propagate heritably in a way so it's 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 r potentially random but not random there's this randomness not randomness aspect of uh of uh, uh, dna and epigenetics that are interplaying uh and get, ah, there's so much so here. about randomness randomness is isn't <laughs> random <laughs> It's not. Well, I mean, okay, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, I think it's episode nine. Well, I'm going to have to look. You've got so up, many actually. episodes. How do you, seriously, do you just have, to look have it in up. front of you on a list? You're like, this no, here we go. 90. I, I was wrong. I was wrong. Automala is 91. Um, so that there's a, a, a mutation in uh, DNA transmission. Okay. Uh, she might be, she might be 82. I don't know. Anyway. The actual episode 92 of Complexity is with Miguel Fuentes and Marco Buongiorno Nardelli. And Miguel wrote a couple of papers with Murray Gelman back in the day when Murray was still alive mm -hmm. on randomness and information theory and makes the, makes the point that we, based on algorithmic definition of complexity, we cannot know whether something is random or not. Yeah. That randomness is basically a, an epistemic property rather than an ontological property. And mm -hmm. other research at SFI in 1999, one of my favorite papers of all time, The Physical Limits of Communication by uh, Chris Moore, Michael Lockman, and Mark Newman. Um, and I, I, I cite this paper all the time, but I also have Chris Moore's old kitchen table. Um, and he uh, <laughs> Moore wrote this paper with them on... Uh, at, like basically saying we need to be a little bit uh, more humble about the search for alien life because as it turns out, an optimally encoded communication between two parties is indistinguishable from black body radiation. And that mm. if you're, if, if we are actually looking for super intelligent aliens and they don't want us to know that they exist, we will never find out. Because right. the They'll optimal it. communication is only detectable to its intended recipient. And, you know, Edward Snowden made a similar point in uh -huh. the interview he did with Neil deGrasse Tyson a few years ago. He said, actually, my explanation yeah. for Fermi's paradox is that they're just smarter than we are and we don't know what to look for. Or they're not smarter. They're just the differences are too great and that we don't right. know what to look for. I mean, it's that same, uh, you know human centric position when it yeah. comes to animals and animal communication. Animals are right. dumb. And who's animal we're intelligent. Other animals aren't intelligent. But here we find out that little bird shaking his tail feathers is actually conveying real like 
information to its partner. That is yes, you know, the three body problem. Yes, although that's a whole different. That's kind yeah. of an interest. Like that's that was you different. know that's dark forest, which is a whole. There's a fantastic yeah. video called the dark forest theory of the <laughs> internet. I recommend watching about how as the profusion of uh, fake news and and uh, uh, generative AI like nonsense, you know that we that we um we end up pulling out of social media. And that's something I've talked about on both podcasts a lot. Oh, <gasps> there you go. Which is, uh, you know, that as we become the, as we become more aware of the fact, I was talking about this with you in the beer AI thing, Kiki, that mm -hmm. as we become more aware of the fact that we are being preyed upon by predatory surveillance capitalism. I, I pull back. I don't do, I, I don't, I'm not doing yeah. social media as much as I used to. Like I used to really in, get into conversations with people and uh, I don't anymore. Well, it's a diminishing marginal return, right? It's just, yeah. Yeah. And, and as a matter of, con, uh, you know, and I'm also, you know, at, at a certain point in your life, you're like, oh, what do I want out of life? Me part. Yeah. What's good. What is the thing that's important? What are my priorities? I, I have, to, have to be on the computer because my kids sit on my lap in business oh. meetings. I was in a, I was in a, is it uh, my cats for me. My son is too old to do that now. <laughs> cats, cats are easy. My, my daughter was crying in my lap because I asked her to leave the room so I could have a business meeting with an important uh, tech founder. I've done today. these. Yep. And I've had those. It was, it was brutal. It I don't want to say no to her, you know, okay. but I also must joust with idiots on Facebook. I must. You must. <laughs> I think along with the testosterone, that, that, that imperative uh, dropped substantially at oh the father. Gosh. And then again, after turning 40, but don't even, don't even. <laughs> what am I, who, who are we trying to prove uh, no. this to? What are we trying to prove and to whom I'm the only people I'm really I... concerned about, uh, Impressive, <laughs> our developer, developer. We need critical thinking. Robert Varner, Paul Disney, and David. Yes. Huh. <laughs> all the, all of you. Yes, Paul Disney. I must sleep soon as well. I am lacking sleep recently. Um, well, usually. Uh, and uh, I have a conference coming up that I'm working on. Science oh, wow. Talk is coming back again to Portland and to the internets beginning next uh wednesday april 3rd oh my god well that's too soon for me to get involved but uh, virtually it. yeah it's a it. lot all of a sudden it's a lot um yeah but well let's let's i uh, need to i i hope we can do this again because obviously yeah. we have many things that are conversationally interesting <laughs> Robert, i hope i'm sorry if i've been reading you wrong it's very hard to tell if someone is i just assume people are coming at me when i say weird things uh and so coming if somebody says you. yeah so um i like i like but, jousting but at the same yeah. time it's you know also in good fun and because we can discuss these things right. as intelligent people who like to talk about things like this. And I don't know if other, right? Yeah. right. I don't mm -hmm. know if developer developer is talking to you or me. Um, this oh, week yes. in France, I imagine the next one is in a week. In a week. Yeah. This week in science will be back in a week. When will the next future fossils be? Ah, the next future fossils will be in a few days. It depends on how nice. annoying my kids are. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's a good one. It's with Neil Thies on complex yeah. systems thinking and non-dual philosophy. So he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a Zen Buddhist practitioner of over 20 years and has written some really interesting consciousness studies uh, pieces. Oh, cool. And he just wrote a book called notes on complexity that you are either going to love or you're going to take issue with because it attempts to bridge complexity science to non-dual philosophy. Yes. And um, if you don't like it, 
Just read the first half. (laughs) (laughs) All right. All right. Everyone who is still here. Yes. Bio break. I need one as well. If anybody's, I've had like my whole soda water and a glass of wine. So I'm like, yes. Hours later. Freedom. (laughs) Michael, thank you again for joining me. I hope that we are able to do this again or connect in a different way because this was a lot of fun. And yeah, we need to talk about the, uh, yeah the AI assisted SciComm heat map tool. Yes, so. absolutely. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll connect offline about that. Cool. Everybody. Thank you so much for being here for, especially those of you who are here at the end of the show. This podcast does have a schedule Wednesdays, 8 PM Pacific time uh, until <laughs> the show ends. Sometimes it's earlier. Sometimes it's later. And Oh, there's Michael Garfield. Oh, look at you. People could actually like scan that or something. Is it a fish? It, is it a QR code? It's both. What is it? It's everything all in one. And it's a, 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 a holographic. Oh my goodness. I appreciate everybody out there. Thank you for your interest and thank you for uh, your comments and ideas uh, as we've been discussing all of these various ideas, which are I don't know, fascinating. I can. This is the stuff that my brain gets excited about. So hence how this conversation kept going. But anyway, uh, bio break, sleep break, everybody out. Bum, bum, bum. You know how this goes. We'll be back again next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time. And in the meantime, I hope you all stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and stay lucky. Take care.